Okay, I think we're going to get started. Is everybody ready? Okay. Um, we have the Joint City Council um, Planning Commission meeting, and I guess we need to call the roll. Susan? Do Here. 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 Here for our semi-annual joint meeting of the City Council and Planning Commission. And as always, I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity for all of us to get together and, and discuss some important matters that the Planning Division is working on and that are, again, <clears throat> the purpose of this discussion is to have the Council and the Planning Commission be updated on some key issues uh, that you may certainly already be well involved in, in, in the case of today the items we're going to be covering. This is a very uh, dynamic time with a lot of meeting and discussion going on on the, the topics we're going to, going to cover today. So this will, we believe, be very helpful to continue to move the discussion along. So we have three uh, primary items for discussion today. The first, uh, I will present a brief overview of certain workload assignments within the planning division. And uh, then I will turn it over to John Ledbetter, who will provide a status report update on Plan Santa Barbara. Um, it's really an overview just in terms of where we are in developing recommendations of the staff and the Planning Commission and then the Council schedule uh, of hearings that we're looking to hold before the end of this year. And then uh, we think that after presenting those two items might be a good time to break for a moment or two if there are any questions or discussion of those two items so that we can then, staff has a brief presentation on the Plan Santa Barbara Interim Zoning and Design Ordinance as well as discussion points for the Council and Planning Commission to consider a possible building height charter amendment. Mm -hmm. And we expect that that third item would be the policy discussion that you all would want to focus on. So if that's okay, uh, we'll run through the first two items. Uh, again, as a work session, the, um, the Council and Commission will want to hear from the public regarding the agenda at some point, but it really is at the discretion of the, the Mayor as to when you'd like to take that input. We have received some speaker slips. Mm -hmm. We also received a few letters today and the members of the community and the audience. We understand that some of them would like to have an opportunity to speak maybe midway through. Mm, just, yeah, that's uh, fine. Good. So yeah. anyway, with that, um, I'll begin. A quick review of a few workload issues in the planning division of note. I wanted to call your attention to the Historic Resources Work Program and some assignments in the design review section. We have a lot of important work um, started within this program, yet year after year we have yet really to bring um, a close to some of this important work. In fact, uh, this point was highlighted by Jim Armstrong yesterday at your P3 report as well, and it is something that um, Mr. Casey, myself, and the staff and design review have, have been talking about. We would uh, like to really have a focus and finish. That's our, our motto here for this work. Um, so I will review uh, what's on the plate. Something that was added that can distract from the focus and finish motto, but it's also very important to, to be responsive when issues come up. And so for this last year, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion amongst the design review boards and the council and the ordinance committee. And just a few weeks ago, the city council adopted a new ordinance that establishes <clears throat> review criteria, which will be the improved communication between the design review boards and the planning commission. So this is a really great new assignment, relatively new, that the, the um, program took on. And we now are looking to implement it. We'll be uh, working with the board and the staff on enhanced minutes, where it's clear 
that the board and commissions are looking at these six criteria and as well as any other important points that they want to communicate we'll be working with the planning commission and in taking in that input and uh, back and forth through the review process another assignment in the historic resources program is the update of the El Pueblo Viejo design guidelines there is a uh, guideline subcommittee and the staff has been working with the subcommittee now for for quite some time well over a year as well they've done substantial amount of work yet the to-do list has not yet been completed and we need to have the HLC wrap up their work and bring those guidelines and present them to City Council the Mills Act we have uh, had some good discussions at the council level and ordinance committee regarding the Mills Act we're working with the city attorney and hope to be able to bring that to the council for adoption of the program very soon um, historic district and design districting plan this is a really foundation element of a, a, a solid historic resources program and we have been working on establishing districting plans and approaches recognizing that throughout the community there are both uh, important historic resources that could constitute a district as well as design issues and the Planning Commission has been discussing this a bit in the plan Santa Barbara update process and they had some recommendations we have a new um, recommended element to the general plan that the council will be learning more about as well community design and historic resources and we really need to get some of the foundation work done so a lot's been done on these tasks but have yet to be completed again something that goes hand in hand is the architectural surveys the field work identifying what's important in the community documenting what's important we have an, a couple of surveys uh, that haven't yet been completed the waterfront area survey and the lower Riviera survey uh, and so having all this work at various stages is of a concern to us we are looking at um, some uh, reassignments and project management bringing in some um, some added muscle to the group to um, to help get these things done also just FYI um, I think before we meet a, we will meet again I think before we present the two-year review of the NPO but that's sometime early next year also so I just wanted to let you know that the new board the single-family design board and the staff have been tracking issues and trends and, and statistics about the work <clears throat> that's being done under the, the updated neighborhood preservation ordinance so that's underway also within this group we have a pending assignment it has not been fully activated but that is the upper state street implementation particularly the design guidelines and we've been coordinating with the public works department regarding the transit lane feasibility study for the upper state street area uh, the last body to discuss that was the finance committee so actually we have scheduled for October 21st staff will be returning to the finance committee and present um, options on a possible approach to um, a couple options on how to approach the Upper State Street implementation <clears throat> staff and the and the finance committee have concerns about funding these uh, major steps at this time and uh, planning staff also has a concern is how does that fit taking on a new program with our focus and finish model so um, that will be discussed I certainly encourage we'll, we'll, we'll make that council agenda report available to the Planning Commission as well to look at the options on Upper State Street a few other important workload items that we have discussed at prior meetings such as this I wanted to touch base <coughs> regarding um, some pending ordinance amendments there is the transfer oh, I'm sorry not transfer tenant displacement assistance ordinance the condominium conversion ordinance and zoning issues that all of these ordinances work in terms of the planning division right now is on a on hold status with no active assignment even though we have begun work on these various issues uh, given other priorities that have come along and staff reassignments the current status is um, no active work however we know this is important work to the community and the council and all of us so we um, are looking forward to being able to take on the update uh, amendments to the tenant displacement ordinance that is listed first as the one that we would look to take on um, as soon as we're we feel we have an opportunity to do so um, 
The condominium conversion ordinance, oh, back to the tenant displacement. I think you all know that the fixes in that ordinance are to address um, issues related to enforcement and cases, illegal units and things. When this ordinance was first developed, it really had in mind that an applicant would come in and propose demolition and be doing a, a, a rebuilding of the site type of project, and it needs to be adjusted to deal with some of the uh, practical difficulties we have, in, in particularly in enforcement. Condominium conversion ordinance is something that the uh, Housing Policy Steering Committee, we've had discussions for some time, and we were about to undertake some work, and then we got really rolling again with Plan Santa Barbara and, and, and haven't been able to take on uh, additional housing policy work. So that is in an on-hold position. Under the zoning ordinance, staff keeps a long list, actually. We just had successful <coughs> completion of what we called round one, and we had these ideas of multiple rounds where we want to get ready for round two. But again, in the practical sense, um, there's been some changing in the staffing and assignment, and so we don't have an active uh, round two work program. But there are some issues that I know, again, are very important, and we are keeping track of them. Uh, there's been some discussion about hedges, and next week at City Council, there'll be a discussion about the city's um, hedge ordinance. Antennas, our antenna ordinance has not been updated to be consistent with federal regulations, and that's causing concern uh, in the community, particularly at the ABR recently has had some concerns about that. There are some sign ordinance updates uh, that we're interested in doing. And then again, we're tracking issues that come up in the modification process that could be addressed by um, am minor amendments in the zoning ordinance. Okay. Um, that's kind of the bad news is that, you know, we have this uh, – important work to do, and it's, it's not particularly active at the moment, but I do want to put it on the board for you all to know that it, it hasn't been lost, and um, we do look for opportunities to, to get back to some of that. Um, part of the reasoning for the fact that we're not actively working on in this is also the, the supervisor transitions that we're going through in the planning division. I think you all have heard these announcements and seen the changes along the way, but I did want to spend a moment just to let you know that what it represents in terms of the leadership and program management in the planning division, I think these are all solid, good decisions that I'm happy, happy to have made, but we are in a transition period. So Danny Cotto is... Um, filling, uh, he has the position as the senior planner and design review, and he's um, been doing his work now with the planning commission and the projects going through planning and environmental review. Renee Brook uh, came back to the planning division from the redevelopment agency, and she's now the lead senior planner in the zoning section. The zoning section went um, through a change in that two people positions were taken out of that section, Susan Reardon as well as Maricela Salinas, associate planner. Um, and we created the new section with Susan Reardon having assumed the staff hearing officer role. And she had a meeting today. She's been, she's been doing quite well. I'm happy to see that she's filling my shoes quite mm -hmm. well, I believe. And we had a uh, status review of the staff hearing officer with the Planning Commission just a few weeks ago. We also have the the procedures and training responsibilities within that section and a job share with Deborah and Deloro as a new supervisor over the environmental review. So that's a lot of transition. Again, good news, and people are picking up the full responsibilities of the jobs, but with the shifts, some of the projects are um, above have been backburnered. So that's my quick overview of the workload. I was now going to turn it the presentation to John Ledbetter for an overview of Plan Santa Barbara, and then we can pause for discussion on okay, these. Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, Chair, uh, members of the uh, Planning Commission. Um, as Betty said, I, I was going to touch on quickly our most recent work products, the Policy Preferences Report, the survey uh, that was conducted on Plan Santa Barbara our recent Planning Commission hearings, and then the upcoming Council meetings. A policy Preferences Report was um, released in September, and uh, the report 
contain a number of uh, different items. A uh, big portion of it was establishing what exactly the general plan and framework uh, is, uh, both in terms of uh, the layout of it, the, the key components, and uh, how they all work together. Uh, specifically, the objectives of what we're coming out of this process with next year when the EIR process is uh, finished will be a land use element and a land use map, um, an updated housing element, and, uh, and then a set of uh, policies that are really geared towards sustainability and a reorganization of the elements. Uh, sustainability plays a huge part in this document, and, and again, this document is really the culmination of where we are in the process, and it reflects what the community has told us and um, serves as the overarching uh, guide, really, if you will, and it's really the updating of the, um, our operating principle of living within our resources. Uh, we feel like this is really a natural and has made a great transition for the community. The bulk of the report is the goals, the objectives, and the policies. Uh, at first, we had developed goals and policies, and one of the uh, important comments that the Planning Commission has um, forwarded to us is to develop objectives, and these objectives really serve well uh, to help us in our implementation through our adaptive management program, and I'll touch on that in just a moment. Um, and, and that's another real key uh, part of it. Very briefly, we think this is a good graphic and helps to explain um, uh, how the uh, Plan Santa Barbara and the General Plan framework um, work together. Here, if you look at this, these are the policy drivers. These are the key policy issues that we grapple with here in Santa Barbara, from growth management to energy and climate change, community character, which is a big focus of our discussion today, as you know, with building heights, open space, setbacks, those physical design issues and then economic and fiscal health, which <laughs> is very timely now. Um, and, and these relate directly to our sustainable principles of, you know, how do we want to see Santa Barbara become a more uh, sustainable community with these issues in mind. So these policies, they translate into the general plan elements, and here is a reorganization of the elements, the seven required elements, as well as um, some uh, a new element, as Betty uh, or Miss Weiss pointed out earlier, the community design and historic resources, and now we've added formally growth management into our land use element. These aren't necessarily the final uh, uh, organization of the general plan elements, and we'll be working further on that next year as we work with our uh, our planning consultant. But what what you get from that though is the implementation action actions, and ultimately that's what happens on the ground. And that's where, where we get our regulations, if we're going to be updating the zoning ordinance, if we're heading towards form-based codes, that sort of thing, programs, and um, ultimately project findings as projects come through the door. The adaptive management program is centers around community indicators, and it's establishing a baseline and then real meaningful indicators so we can see, we can gauge our progress towards becoming a more sustainable uh, a community, and I, and I was reflecting on these um, last week, and I was realizing and looking at them, when you look at those community indicators, and as we develop these, um, in conjunction with our objectives for each one of the, the general plan, the goals, um, they, they really end up looking a lot like our P3 indicators, and uh, because we do want them to be measurable, and we do want to have, you know, be able to gauge those against policy. So, um, I think it's a it's a really nice fit and it works well for our community. So that's essentially the, the framework of it. Um, the other uh, product that we worked on uh, since our last uh, meeting was the survey, and this is something that um, the council directed us to do as a suggestion of some of the community members. And we this survey was conducted in. Uh, August by the, the same firm that has been working on our utility tax, and they, they conducted a survey regarding that as well. And we were very happy with them. We thought they were very professional and did a, uh, a good job. What they told us essentially was what the track that we're on now, it, it, what the issues that we have identified and that we have been pursuing is really on track with the broader community. This was a, you know, 400 people were surveyed and uh, it was a broad cross-section of the community telephone uh, survey. 
And uh, issues like, you know, open space, reducing carbon emissions, alleviating traffic congestions, and creating affordable housing, I mean, these are all issues that we know are, are key to what the community is concerned about. One of the surprises for us, frankly, and maybe not for some of you, but <laughs> was that uh, traffic continues to be a top priority. Um, uh, but the other priorities, uh, again, maintaining the city's character, a biggie ma managing our growth, increasing the supply of housing, particularly for the middle-income families, were all identified as important issues. Uh, finally, the, the building heights, and, and this was something that we asked this question in a number of different ways to, to try and get at it uh, because it is uh, central to a lot of, of the community's angst and concern right now. And the initial findings were of 56% of the residents that were pulled believe that the existing height limit should be maintained. However, <laughs> these opinions do shift depending on how you out ask the question and uh, you know what it's being compared against, what the, the decisions are. And then finally, it was very clear that um, demographics play a big part in uh, how people view heights. And so when you looked at it, you broke these out by age, income, uh, and their general awareness of what our uh, height limits are, uh, you get different uh, answers. So uh, this continues to be an interesting subject, and um, we have more to discuss on that, obviously. Uh, so now turning to uh, what, uh, where we have been over the last few months, um, following the release of the policy preferences report and the survey, we presented that um, to the Planning Commission on the 10th and the 11th, uh, starting with the survey results and on the 10th and also uh, the general plan framework. And we spent a good part of the day uh, hearing from the community, a public hearing. It was a really good turnout, and we had a lot of good input on that. And then on the second day, we delved specifically into the policies. And we didn't talk about every single one, but we talked about almost all of them. There are 130 of them. It was a very long day and, and a very productive day. We got a lot of good feedback from the Planning Commission, and, and we appreciate that. Um, but we didn't tie the bow on the 11th, <laughs> so we came back on the, 11, on the 25th. And here we really focused on the growth management issues, and uh, you know, uh, those are, are key to uh, how we're going to move forward here. And then specifically how that translates into a preferred project that we're going to be studying in the EIR and the alternatives. And there was a lot of um, um, discussion on those issues. And uh, we feel like, again, we got some good direction there. And so that, along with maps and the importance of, uh, uh, of continuing to develop our maps both as a uh, analytical tool and then ultimately for that land use map that will uh, go together with the land use document are so these are the directions that we're working on as you sp as we speak here and so we'll come back to the Planning Commission um, next month uh, and uh, with a new iteration of the document that will reflect their uh, recommendations and essentially that'll be the document that comes uh, to the Planning Commission so we have the planning committee, or excuse me, to the council. And so the c council uh, meetings are now scheduled for uh, the morning of December 11th. Um, and then uh, Tuesday, the 16th, December 16th is a Tuesday, and that's a 6 p.m. start in the evening. And again, it will be a public hearing. And um, what we'll be looking for direction will be uh, specifically on those items that I listed earlier that will be the outcome of this process for us to go forward with a general plan update that will include a land use element update, housing element update, land use map, and, uh, and then the set of sustainability uh, policies, uh, both that will tie together the existing policies and uh, that reflect new and amended policies. And then the other portion of it will be the um, initiation of the environmental review process. And with that direction, then we can go back to the Planning Commission for the formal scoping, which will kick off the whole EIR process. So that concludes my presentation. Madam Mayor? Yeah. Um, before beginning the presentation on the interim ordinance and charter, we wanted to pause if the council or commission had any questions. But we are trying to keep this presentation brief. So perhaps before we hear from the public, the public would also like to hear the staff yeah. presentation on this. Um, but it certainly wanted to pause for a minute whether or not the Commission wanted to address Plan Santa Barbara at this moment or if you had any questions regarding the pending ordinances and um, um, historic 
preservation work program. Okay. Are there any questions? This is good to get us all on the same page. So that's Madam Mayor. Here. Yes. A Mr. Question, Francisco. Yeah. Question for Mr. Ledbetter. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't present at the Planning Commission discussion of the policy preferences when you got to the circulation element. How much feedback did you get on that one? How much feedback from the Planning Commission? Um, we got a fair amount of feedback. Um, the, you know, a real central tenet of this plan is the uh, what we're referring to as the mobility-oriented development area, and what that essentially is is targeting our um, our future growth within uh, walking distance of transit, and so looking at especially the the commercial areas and then those residential single-family areas that might accommodate a. Um, uh, a second unit, so so that's an important part of that. Um, other aspects of it were uh, um, the uh, setback, the 500 foot setback from the freeway that the Regional Air Quality Board has put out in, in terms of guidelines, and and uh, you know how how applicable is that to our community or already built out community, and what would be the impacts if we were to to just adopt that willy nilly. Um, some of the uh, uh, other comments were related to if we are going to uh, look at targeting our future growth adjacent to transit, then we need to be, have a little bit more forward thinking, not just exactly where the transit lines are, but look at where future transit lines might possibly be. How could we tie in areas like the Mesa or um, Coast Village Road or down towards the waterfront? Um, we didn't. Uh, I don't believe there was a whole lot of discussion about parking, uh, but there was some, and traffic. Um. I guess I'm. I'm really wondering how much pushback there was, because, you know, you you introduced this by saying that this is based on input from the community, and there are policies in here like eliminating curbside parking to make room for bike lanes that I don't think there's a huge wave of support for in the community. Hmm. Uh, Council Member uh, Francisco, perhaps members of the Commission would like to respond directly in terms of their feedback on those policies. My take on it was it was fairly positive. Uh, you also had suggestions for dealing with residential parking um, issues within the Moda area, perhaps in new and different ways. Uh, the Planning Commission regularly deals with uh, circulation p element policy issues, and this was a great opportunity for them to step back and look forward. You know, what direction, particularly under climate change, energy use, um, the sustainability principles, and just continuing the good work it, that's been laid out in the circulation element, I, I found that it was a full discussion with added input. That's how I would summarize it. But perhaps some of the commissioners who added to that discussion or participated would like to add. Yes, Mr. White. Madam Mayor, um, I think one point that, that one overarching uh, theme that, that where traffic was important was in this so-called adaptive management where it, we'd have a, a pot of change of growth, five year, a five-year increment of growth and that, that would, there would be an attempt to measure that and its impacts on the, 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 the city. And of course, not only it, but the sort of uh, the regional changes that are occurring outside of our own growth, uh, the, the increase in traffic from LA, shall we say, and then come back and, and see in five years whether we're still having our level of service C uh, at, at intersections and such. So I think that that tool of of cycling back on a on a shorter basis than what we've done in the in the past is one of the things, and the tra and the for example level of service C is one of those uh, policies that are one of those goals that the city has. Uh, so those would be measured regularly as uh, in in the in concert with any growth that would occur. Okay. Sure. Anything else? Yes. Sure. Thank you. Um, and some of. Hello. <laughs> some of the uh, 
members of the public may also comment on this. We have two letters, one from Allied Neighborhood Association and one from the League of Women Voters about the general plan also having to do with the RENA numbers, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment numbers that were given given to the City of Santa Barbara. And, and can Mr. Ledbetter or Mr. Casey or how does that all fit into what we're doing here and or does it fit or can you comment on that? Yeah, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Council uh, Woman Schneider, uh, thank you very much for, I was going to bring up that point when we were talking about uh, that discussion at the second um, on, on the Planning Commission meeting of the 25th because that really was a central focus of the whole discussion as of how do we, um, how do we reconcile uh, monitoring our growth, particularly residential units, and still meeting our arena number. And as you know, our reading no arena number now has just about doubled from the past 2,300, about 4,000, you know, way beyond 4,000. Um, and so that's a tough one, and that's why we were going back and looking at how we could um, uh, um, tailor the the wording, if you will, in our growth management policy related to um, residential so that we do uh, go back and monitor and look at indicators of our resources of do we have uh, adequate resources to build out and we, our starting point was a number of 2,000 units and if you know after a 10-year assessment we feel like yes we do have a, a sufficient amount of resources then potentially we could uh, continue to build up into say the arena number that was one of the proposals that was uh, floated and uh, but not everybody feels comfortable with that and the whole idea that you're even contemplating or putting that arena number in the document makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable that know that you know we could definitely uh, end up going there whether we like that or not so that's something that I think that the the Planning Commission is really and I, I, if I uh, may dare to speak for you at, at this mm -hmm. point has struggled with in terms of how we reconcile this and I know staff we've, we've really tried hard to, to figure a solution out and it's not an easy one um, at one point we thought, okay, well, you can put as a separate housing policy that we will accommodate, find an accommodation for the, for the 4,500, but yet in the housing policies themselves specifically keep it pretty tightly worded in terms of linking uh, future housing growth to available resources, quote, living within our resources. But again, then, then we had uh, Mr. Vincent uh, weigh in on that in terms of the legal, legality of it and being consistent between your housing element and your land use element. So um, it, it's something that we, we haven't got the silver bullet for, for it yet, but we're working on that. And I, it would be you know, that's, I would like to hear, or I think the Planning Commission can, can help uh, uh, elucidate that point as well. Okay. Yeah. Bruce, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think some of the other discussions that we had relative to circulation were analyzing not just traffic, but looking at the bigger picture mode share, you know, what percentages would be pedestrians and bicycles and bus and other other modes of transit so that the total trips related to uh, potential projects then get distributed out to the different modes and we're not counting all trips as being automobile trips I mean obviously we can't keep up that or we're going to strangle ourselves with cars so uh, that was one thing that's going to be implemented as we move forward and I think the other thing that we talked about was the necessity to really relook at our mapping, both in terms of the proposed MODA, the mobility oriented you know, district versus the central business district versus the historic district. And they need to be, I think, more exacting in terms of where are the historic resources, where is the transit, where is the business. I mean, all those things have changed over the years and I think more correct mapping will help us then realize that all those are distinctly different districts, but there are areas of overlap. So all that really came into play in the discussion of the circulation element. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just one uh, thing about the circulation part of it being that this is the land use element really but we're we've got some policies in there about transportation and the um, point that I had 
in our meeting was that the city's ambitions for housing, denser housing or housing that is uh, located downtown, would require that there be more public transit or that a broader modality of transit, as Mr. Bartlett pointed out, would be required. Uh, because if we just keep relying on cars, then the traffic is going to get worse. And we've seen from every survey and public comment that traffic is an issue. So um, the, the ambition for more housing needs to continue to look at traffic and specifically at funding for alternative modes of transportation. Because our traffic capacity, like our water capacity and our uh, solid waste materials capacity is limited and unless we find a way to conserve it then we will um, we will run out of convenient transportation cars <clears throat> sorry that's making a buzz um, I also wanted to talk about the arena numbers and uh, perhaps mr. white would comment on it too when that um, when we were looking at the uh, land use policy I guess we'll call it LG one is what it was uh, that's where the number was specified that the city would plan for 2,000 residences and the city attorney let us know well you can't put in your general plan that you're planning for less than your um, arena number and so we had a good deal of discussion about that um, my perspective was somewhat in line with the city attorneys and that I thought we should get rid of the number altogether um, the arena number is something that the city at present could accommodate and I feel it's um, not in our not in our best interest as planners to put that number into our general plan and just to tell you why uh, I worked for 14 years in the University of California system and the way budgeting in the state can sometimes work is that one can be given an impossible task such as making huge cutbacks or rebudgeting your department and so let's say University Department A and University Department B are both told to cut back by 10 percent Department A says we can't do it there's no way don't take our money away from us and then Department B says we can do it it'll be draconian we'll make cuts we'll get grants well further down the line what happens is the one that showed they could get cut back they get cut back again next year and next year and next year and the one that said we're so important we can't cut back one bit they keep getting more money so there's this um, this irony in state bureaucracy thinking and I think that if we say in our general plan that we can accommodate this arena number guess what you know if we can do it this time darn I'll bet we can do it again next time and the time after that so I'm really concerned about using that number in our general plan doubly concerned in that if the city is going to dispute that number one of the things that SB CAG was supposed to consider in their allocation of housing is our general plan so if we put in our general plan that we can accommodate any number they give us we lose our ground for um, for contesting that number so I thought the number should be taken out and that's why I did not vote uh, with the majority on that um, 2,000 to 4,500 uh, 2,000 to 4, 4,500 number of houses. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I I uh, felt that the uh, conversation we had about Moda was very good, uh, although at a previous meeting or earlier in that meeting, Rob Dayton had. Uh, Oh, maybe it was a previous meeting. Anyway, he had elucidated three reasons why uh, the Mesa, Cliff Drive, was not a good corridor for that. And he wasn't there for that discussion, so I, I never felt that we had fully had the complete discussion. And also, uh, there was no real, uh, I felt, sp pinpointed area in the waterfront discussing that for for a lot of housing so I don't I didn't feel uh, from my standpoint that the conversation about it was complete in any way so I feel that that is still out there and I had heard that I mean we sort of felt in the meeting that well the EIR might you know that goes into scoping but at the same time I, I would hate to have that conversation not be fully not be fully vetted before our plan rolls out and all of a sudden there it is and we all go oh look at that the other thing is uh, 
there are areas in the city when you look at the bus route just as a as a, your own aerial view on a map where there is no transit available where there could be some small transit available to collect people to take them other places and I don't feel that the circulation element addresses that need and I still feel that that is something we need to look at um, at least in concept realizing the limitations of funding and everything else we're all getting so um, so uh, those are those are my comments so we're, we're I feel like we're getting there but we, we are not completely there to the point where I can say oh good send it send, send it off to school not ready yet we have several people that would like to speak. Is this a good time? Yeah, just a second. Yeah. Staff would appreciate an opportunity to quickly present the okay. the height issues before okay. you start hearing from the public on that. Okay, so perfect. we did want to give our um, presentation if possible. But okay, and let's thanks. have Addison, <clears throat> one last person here. Thank, thank Go you, ahead. Sure. On the issue of the residential dwelling unit numbers, this, I think, gets down to what is really a policy issue, and this is a good venue to bring that up uh, with the council here. How much does the city want to go to the mat with HCD and with SBCAG over these numbers? We, on the Planning Commission, spent a lot of time, as John mentioned, almost the whole meeting, talking about how can we craft the wording of our general plan to straddle a fence. And cover both the requirement from SBCAG and yet still keep the growth that we're planning for in our historic growth rate of about 100 units a year over a 20-year period. So this is, I think, a, a policy issue, and that is how much does the city want to go to the mat with HCD and SBCAG over these numbers that we've been given? Do we put it in the general plan or do we thumb our nose at them and say, we're not going to put it in the plan. Well, just so you know that we have, I mean, I'm the representative on SBCAG, and I didn't just sit down and let them roll over us. Um, and, uh, you know, but they were very firm in their uh, belief that because we have a jobs housing imbalance, that we have to build more housing, which we also agree, but not, you know, not so, an X number of units, which turned out to be yeah. way more than they ever talked about. Uh, so it wasn't easy. It wasn't good, and uh, we actually lost votes as I was <laughs> as I was speaking. Uh, <laughs> we had three votes mm -hmm. against it, and then it went down to one vote against yeah. it. So, um, well, as you I'm remember that at, at that meeting when some of us were there yeah. to raise the points, uh, we tried to raise the issue that the jobs housing imbalance is a regional yeah. issue. It's not a it's city a issue. South Coast issue. Uh, yeah, South Coast yeah. as a regional body. And that's the way we had thought it ought to be approached, mm -hmm. but we got slammed down from SBCAG that that wasn't the way that the majority of the county is looking at it. Sure. So again, I'd, I'd say to me it seems uh, to be on the policy level. We in the Planning Commission can try to straddle a fence and, and try to come up with verbiage that will accommodate the numbers from uh, SBCAG on our arena numbers, but also to, to make it obvious that we're planning to grow within our resources at the rate we've right. traditionally grown at. Right. But that's going to be hard to do, I know. To, to try to I straddle the fence. Yeah. Mayor, just to put some context on that, I agree with everything that Mr. Thompson and others have said, that it's, it's going to be a challenge for us. We appealed at SBCAG. Uh, as Mayor Bloom said, we lost votes. Uh, they submitted their proposal to HCD, and we've been in the process of drafting a letter to protest at HCD. They approved SBCAG's submittal within one day of its receipt. And so... Uh, that was disappointing, and so we're going to send a protest letter to HCD to say that uh, even though they have 60 days to approve it, we were pretty shocked that they approved it in one day. Uh, and really where this will play out is in our preparation of our housing element, because that's right. the formal document that we'll have to submit to HCD. And so I completely agree it's going to be a policy question for us as we uh, submit that housing element and prepare it over the next nine months or so. Uh, and as you know, the dance kind of is, is you submit a housing element to HCD, they review it, they give you comments back as to whether it's approved or not, and if not, why, and what they would recommend you need to do to get an approval, and that will kind of continue our policy dance at that point about how to go forward with that. 
Well, and there's also a new uh, bill in the, that was signed by the governor, 375. Yes. And it's it's huge, and we have to really be watching that. And, and it has to do with transit development, and transit oriented development, and and all kinds of things. So. SB 375. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's uh, uh, the attempt is to try to implement the AB 32 legislation dealing with right. greenhouse gas emissions and trying to tie housing development and transportation funding together, which I think is a great concept that we could probably uh, support as a city. Uh, it gets implemented locally by SBCAG, mm -hmm. and so you know we'll. So you can we'll expect need to see, more problems. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, you know, so we're going to have to I see mean, how yeah. that goes, and yeah. it's pretty ill-defined in my mind as to how it is to be implemented. I've read the legislation three different times, and I'm still trying to yeah. to grapple with it. And so I think each jurisdiction is going to have to work on that, and there's a lot of discussion starting about how that will be implemented. That's right. Addison? <clears throat> One final observation on what Mr. Casey said, and that is, while it's true that the arena numbers are primarily uh, focused in the housing element, we can't ignore them in the land use element because they have the, the general plan has to be internally consistent between the elements, so we can't have it both ways, in other words. Well, we all agree. Maybe we need to get somebody up in Sacramento yeah. who can do yeah. the right things. Um, but anyway, okay. So go ahead, and then we're, we have people from the public. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah. The next topic for discussion is uh, the discussion of an interim ordinance related to zoning and or design issues, standards, and a possible charter amendment. To brief the Council and Planning Commission, I'll comment on the Ordinance Committee review. We've had two um, discussions at the Ordinance Committee last month, September 23rd and 30th. Um, in that discussion, there was good input from the public. They raised a number of questions, which I'll be summarizing as a result of this uh, presentation. And the committee looked at standards. Uh, there was a review of existing zoning standards related to issues of open space setback, unit sizes, heights. Uh, also, there was a comparison of the earlier ideas presented by members of the community in April um, for a possible interim ordinance. We also, as staff, put out some ideas for discussion. We're really not at a recommendation level, but the ordinance committee was starting to get into the details on possible ordinance standards, and so that's been a good discussion. As a result of that discussion, at this point, it appears that the committee isn't interested in taking on changes to unit sizes. Uh, members of the commission, I think Commissioner White was there speaking once on this issue, and then staff at the second meeting on the 30th again put in a plug that we think that dealing with unit size issues <coughs> now might be a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think the committee, and certainly we have our committee members here today could speak to it, felt simplicity, timeliness, um, is important in this subject, and I will be covering that a bit more as well. The FAR or wedding cake standard, whether or not that would be something that would fit into an interim ordinance related to building designs and heights at this time has been discussed. Again, these have been, in my view, pretty much preliminary discussions. We're certainly not at the final determination level, and there would need to be a process um, in further considering an interim ordinance. Uh, the committee did make a motion, and it, it was passed uh, unanimously, that the committee continue to work on an interim ordinance that would be in place until Santa Barbara, Plan Santa Barbara is complete, and also identify key elements for a, a future charter amendment. So in this discussion at the Ordinance Committee in the two meetings and with the input from the public, um, Really, there are some key issues here, and what staff is hoping to do is to assist you all in a key issue policy direction sort of discussion that will be very important in moving forward with, with one or both of these um, issues of a charter amendment and or a, um, interim ordinance. So one, I think clearly there's a lot of agreement amongst the community, including members of council staff, that this effort is to be responsive to community interests. And given that community character design, building heights, massiveness, open space, setbacks, all of those things are so important in the community uh, that the Plan Santa Barbara process and Council and Planning Commission as policy decision makers want to be active decision makers and responsive. So 
certainly that is why we're all having this discussion <clears throat> the members of the community that came to the meetings uh, right off the bat said we're not clear that may be your intent but further what is the intent of this group the ordinance committee at this time discussing a possible interim ordinance is this as a supplement to the current pending uh, initiative from the community to lower the building heights to 40 feet because improved front yard setbacks or open space standards and such could be very compatible and supplement the um, the reduction of building height or really are you talking about setting out an alternative choice and an alternative set of um, issues particularly with regard to building height and then again with the compatible supplemental design issues of setbacks and open space and such so I think that that is one of the policy questions for you all to have what is this direction that the council will be um, giving on an interim ordinance so then there's the question of the approach we want to be responsive to the community interests which are broad and varied in the regard to how the city should be planned for the future in terms of its height and and space and land use um, growth patterns so is the approach in this instance as an interim ordinance an ordinance only would that be an effective step an appropriate step for the council to take given where we are in a plan Santa Barbara general plan update process that can take some time to complete and come up with solid implementation programs such as sustainable neighborhood planning form based codes and a lot of things that will take some time to develop an ordinance an interim ordinance is a very useful tool for you all in the community and the decision makers planning commission etc to have so it could be the approach is to continue with an ordinance and an ordinance only another approach is an ordinance and a charter amendment and at this time I think that's where the the, the sense of the ordinance committee appears to be that they're working on both but we're not quite clear about if we really are and what would be in there and so that's why we think that this discussion today on the approach and what we're doing could be very helpful um, certain members of the community came forward and said look all of this is really important but it's taking away from the plan Santa Barbara effort the ordinance will be nice and helpful but you know the key issue is a charter amendment and you really should be focusing on a charter amendment um, time and effort is of, of essence and this should be the ball that the, your eyes on so there's a question in terms of intent and approach to res be responsive so then content content and substance what would go in an ordinance and what would go in a charter amendment from <clears throat> the motion of the ordinance committee and the members here that can discuss it as well right now it's like everything's on the table and we're talking about design standards heights etc um, staff and the city attorney have advised the committee and, and we think that the direction as to are we pursuing one or the other or both would be very helpful and we think that what goes in an ordinance generally speaking is a bit different than what goes in a charter amendment so uh, the drafting of the language its simplicity its clarity its ability to be modified or, or other things like that really you treat them differently if you're in an ordinance or a charter amendment so again depending on the direction um, that we glean from this discussion in terms of the process and timeline the next step would be soon to follow up from this discussion today to receive council direction today is a work session a discussion so there's no formal action given but we expect that as a result of this discussion action and direction will be needed and desired so that we would return to council soon for direction on what we are drafting what descriptions project descriptions what are we drafting in terms of an ordinance and or a charter amendment and then as noted as well we would have a timeline with a public process um, we've only just initially discussed that with the um, community at the ordinance committee meetings there's certainly an interest to understand these issues in the visual visual realm since we are talking <clears throat> about community character and building design and height it's really important that we have a public process on this whether it's an ordinance and or a charter amendment what does this mean what what do these buildings look like now what would they look like what could be um, accommodated is that something that people 
either support or have concerns about. We will also need to complete environmental reviews, so the sooner that we have the direction on what we're pursuing, get drafts before the Ordinance Committee, drafts and, uh, and discussion amongst the community. We'll also be doing environmental review. And if the direction is to pursue an alternate choice on the ballot for 2009, we would need the City Council to be able to act, placing any particular charter amendment on the ballot before the middle of next year with completion of all these steps, including the environmental review. So. I have the language of the existing Charter Section 1506 regarding building height limitations here on the screen if we need to refer to it at any point. And then also Save El Pueblo Viejo initiative language. The change is shown in the yellow if as in the course of your discussion you'd like to refer back to these. Um, based, do you need me to review what they are? Or? Okay, I'll just move on. So in conclusion, again for today, your discussion are we pursuing a charter amendment? Yes, no, what would it be about? Um, and the timing. Uh, and timing under charter amendment has an explanation mark. <laughs> Interim ordinance, uh, yes, no, substance, and timing. And timing there has a question mark because it is a little bit more related to the plan Santa Barbara and the recommendations that will be forthcoming. At least this is how staff sees the policy discussion, yeah. wanting to frame it for your discussion today. So, thank you. And just to be clear, the uh, charter amendment on the ballot um, a year from this November would need, uh, if we put it on, it would need uh, environmental review, and it would need it before we put it on, right? So That's correct. In the next several months, yeah, and we'd so be working months, on it. Oh, okay. You'd have to start when in order to do it by July? Well, <laughs> the timeline is that we would do environmental review on the proposal. So, yeah. yes, we'd like to have council direction soon as to continue to work on an ordinance and or the, the charter amendment, and let's have the charter amendment deal with building height. Um, that is what the charter section 1506 that's currently mm -hmm. pending. If the idea is that there would be a choice, amend charter section 1508 this way or amend charter 15. I said eight. 1506 this way or amend it another way. Okay. And so, uh, yes, we would we would be having public discussion February, March. Thank you. Is that the answer? We have to finish it. We think we, yeah, you would need to have an idea of what your charter amendment is going to be by February or March in order to do the environmental That's review right. and then take those final actions by the end of June. Okay. Interesting. We live in fun times, don't we? Okay. Uh, we have several people who want to speak, so let's have, uh, I, I'll just call you in the order we received them. Judy Arias, if we can kind of, uh, we've got some letters here. We will read them and understand them, hopefully. Um, the problem I had yesterday's council meeting, we had a three-minute timeline, and some guy kept going on and on and on, didn't he? Some guy, yeah, over there. <laughs> yeah, some attorney, I know. So, um you know, we've got to, if you can get in and make your points, that's probably better. And Judy will be followed by Dave Davis. All right. I'm Thank here, you. I'm here representing the Allied Neighborhood Association. Okay. And they're concerned about some of the recommendations that you are considering along with this plan, Santa Barbara, and that these recommendations uh, depend upon very questionable assumptions. And these assumptions really merit very serious study. So far, we've seen it proceed on the assumption that smart growth formula is universally applicable. However, Santa Barbara is unique, and we need to recognize that as we go along. Um, we have um, seen what's happened nationally when we have decisions being made without proper assumptions, and we need to know that we can't build the, the assumption that we can't build our way out of the housing imbalance is also based on, a, on, on an assumption that needs to be uh, identified. You owe them, and we owe our community the research to make the correct decisions for the future. Uh, one of the assumptions is that audible dependency will, in our city will um, result in transit-oriented development and will, will work. We're not sure about that. And in-city development will reduce the pressure on open spaces. And given the degree and the control that we have on the adjacent open spaces in our city, I don't know whether we can have any success in that. 
and will privately develop in-housing projects and are in our desirable city substantially accomplish the displacement of commuters. That needs to be really very carefully studied. We urge that the EIR give direct attention to these types of assumptions, and if it is not able to do it in the EIR, then the city council should establish a commission of independent studies so that, uh, that, that this information can be given a thorough and fair examination. The RENA numbers, as you've heard today, are a very serious consideration to us. Um, the, the, the fact that 1,888 units uh, required are above moderate income makes a mockery of our sustainability, which is toted as being the keynote of our general plan. We need to have the EIR focus on the inquiries on how compliance with ARENA numbers squares with our available resources. The recent signing of SB 375 needs to be fully understood in conjunction with ARENA numbers. We urge the council to set up a work session with the city's attorney so that they can understand the requirements and conditions of this bill. Compliance with ARENA numbers would result in potential water shortage, implementation of the desal plant, resulting in very expensive water for our community, increasing the sewage plant, increasing police and fire and other essential infrastructures. You have to ask yourself, are the taxpayers of the city at this time willing to take on such additional taxes and burdens? All these concerns need to have a final public vote on the key elements of the proposed general plan, particularly those that recommend and affect growth and development. Finally, one last comment. We are not the only city finding ourselves in the same position as the, with arena numbers. We are certain we would not be alone in protesting these numbers. And as I understand that there's coordination efforts already underway regarding these numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave Davis will be followed by Mickey Flax. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council, members of the Planning Commission staff and public. I'm Dave Davis. I'm speaking today as the Executive Director of the Community Environmental Council. <clears throat> Let me start with a compliment relative to the, your plan, Santa Barbara process. Not only has your staff provided you in the policy preferences report a great framework for the beginning of a really sustainable future for this community, and I think that framework is there, but you have one heck of an incredible planning commission in terms of the level of discussion, review, and comment, it has really been at the highest level. And I, I just got to compliment them. It's really been something. And you guys are very, should be very proud of the work that they've done for you as council people. Okay. <clears throat> Commenting on, on Judy's comment relative to does transit-oriented development work or whatever, let me also basically look forward rather than back. And I really believe that market forces and peak oil are going to solve that problem. And the problem isn't going to be, does it work? The problem is going to be, do we have enough alternatives to keep this community viable? I'm not worried about whether it works or not. I'm worried about whether we can supply the alternatives to really move goods and services and people in the future to keep this place what it is. <clears throat> Let me move on to the question of building heights. I was one who spoke at the ordinance committee to say that the need for the interim ordinance is passed. The community came to you a year ago or more and said, do that in order to put your finger in the plug as you go through Plan Santa Barbara at the height of the pressure relative to new projects coming in the process. Council at that time did not do that. They went forward with an initiative. Some of us attempted to compromise with those people promoting the initiative to forestall and get the decision back into the Plan Santa Barbara process. That didn't work. The initiative is going forward. That's a fait accompli. And market forces, again, have stepped in. You don't not going to have a rush to the pipeline, not any time in the near future. Let me tell you that, in fact, we're going to have problems with filling the buildings which have been built. So that pressure is off. The issue, though, is a good one for Plan Santa Barbara. And all of those issues relative to building heights, setbacks, landscaping, open space, FARs, unit sizes, you should spend your time doing that with the community over the next year, right? Forget the interim ordinance, truly. But on the other item, 
I strongly urge you to look at the placement of an alternative ballot measure which gives the community a choice. <clears throat> it has to be simple. Stay away from the unit sizes and all the things which are, if you will, the things which will drag you down into Never Never Land. Keep it simple. Building heights uses setbacks in landscaping. In fact, because you want to not get into environmental review issues, keep the existing building heights and simply indicate that the uses over 45 feet have to provide community benefit, either affordable workforce or community priority uses. So you change the landscaping minimum, landscaping minimum setback, and you indicate that in fact ordinance will implement more detail for different areas within the city where it's appropriate. But you keep the charter amendment, current height, restricting uses over 45 to community benefit, and setting minimum landscape and open space. That way you get through the process. It may not even be a project under environmental review, as Measure E was not a project under CEQA. So with that, um, again, SB 375. <clears throat> One last comment on that. Both at CEC and in my other day job at MTD, we actually suggested that the Regional Transportation Plan, which is the implementing mechanism for that type of, of funding, really be reopened because of the change in the nature of, one, the law, two, the nature of the, if you will, petroleum gas crisis in this country, and three, the changing nature of the politics of AB 32 and global warming. If you looked at the responses in the final EIR or in the staff report before the adoption at SBCAG, they said, we'll see you in five years. We think that's too long. I think, in fact, we'll be back asking SBCAG and hopefully with your support to reopen that RTP to really look at how we should be doing land use and transportation funding to give us a better community. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, our uh, SBCAG was one of only the only one in 58 counties, uh, the other 57 counties all came up with a land use blueprint uh, for their county, and we haven't. We're the only ones that haven't, so I think there's got to be a lot of work to do there, and maybe we can start it here, but anyway. Um, Mickey Flax will be followed by Jeremy Meyer. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> if, uh, just before I start, I want to specifically address the uh, height initiative, but before I start, I was at the SBCAG meetings and heard specifically the North County supervisors saying, well, we don't care if the housing is in the city. If you want to work it out regionally in the South Coast region, that's okay with us. So um, I would suggest that that might be one way of beginning to deal with it. God forbid we actually have interjurisdictional uh, you know, agreement and working things out. And if we can make a South Coast jobs housing balance, which is what I advocated at SBCAG, then we might be able to solve our dilemma. Um, that's not what I came here to talk mm -hmm. about, however. Um, the, the history of this um, uh, height initiative is uh, long and complex. Um, you've heard about the fact that we tried to have a compromise uh, that fell apart at the last minute, but the fact that there was an attempt at a compromise indicates that there's a good deal of both consensus and division in the community. That was further indicated by the survey that you did, a uh, survey that we did. Um, it's a complex issue. I have said from the beginning that the issue was so complex that it's probably not something that should be handled by an initiative, but nevertheless, that went out there, and the signature gatherers said it had to be simple, because when you approach somebody for signatures, you cannot discuss a uh, complex initiative. It has to be a very simple kind of thing or you're not going to get the signatures. And I agree with that. So it wound up quite simple. Now what we are proposing, we being uh, SB for All, is that the opportunity for council to place an initiative on the ballot can get at some more of the complexities that a signature driven initiative could not. And specifically the kinds of things that people in the surveys and in public comments seem to raise. Namely, that there is need for um, a, 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 exceptions to the, lim to the uh, height limit, 
uh, particularly for community benefits, which are defined to include affordable housing and rentals, as well as the traditional fire stations and hospitals. The present initiative does not allow for that. So that's an important thing that a new initiative uh, could have. Uh, also, the question of minimal setbacks and, and uh, landscaping could also be addressed in that initiative. Um, uh, we are proposing, we are agreeing that a 45-foot height limit throughout the city, a maximum of that, uh, except for community benefit projects, uh, should also be uh, a part of this initiative. Um, the the um, SP for All has said that the existing height limits, 60 feet in the downtown area, have adequately served the needs of the community for many years. That limit has allowed our caring community to maintain our city's character and protect both its vitality and charm. Existing policies and ordinances should be strengthened and expanded to require findings for non-residential or mixed-use projects to promote appealing and comfortable pedestrian street environments. Behind you is a uh, diagram or a rendering of uh, what architects in 1925 envisioned for the city. It includes a 60-foot limit. Uh, all of the uh, roof elements there of the, of the tallest buildings are above 60 feet, as well as a tower uh, that's well above 60 feet. Uh, I'm sorry, it's that one. <laughs> um, that vision, which has guided uh, planning commissions and architectural boards of review and everybody that meets in this room for many years, should not be lightly thrown away. Um, let's al allow the citizens of Santa Barbara to have a rational choice uh, on an initiative that is more comprehensive than that which is currently on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy Meyer will be followed by Gil Berry. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Mr. Chairman and the members of the City Council and Planning Commission. My name is Jeremy Meyer. I'm representing the Coalition for Community Wellness as well as the Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics. And our membership, the Coalition for Community Wellness, includes many of the major health care organizations in Santa Barbara, Cottage Health System, Sansom Clinic, Sansom Diabetes Research Institute, the County Public Health Department, the clinics, and many more. One could ask why health professionals would attend such a meeting. The answer is simple, because we have come to understand that the single most important way we can strike at the root cause of the chronic disease epidemic facing our community is to help build a sustainable city. A city that is walkable and bikeable, where excellent public transit exists, affordable local housing, and easy access to healthy foods. There is absolutely no question that a significant relationship exists between the built environment and chronic disease. Those living in sprawling counties are likely to walk less, weigh on average six pounds more, and have a greater prevalence of hypertension than those living in compact communities. Santa Barbara and our affiliated worker communities in Ventura, Oxnard, and Santa Maria are no exception to this rule. Over 50% of adults, 28% of children, and 36% of our teens are considered overweight or obese. As this epidemic of obesity skyrockets, so do the related epidemics of diabetes and heart disease. When an overweight father dies of a heart attack while commuting to work, what will cause the cause of death be on a certificate? Probably it will be cardiovascular disease. But truly, couldn't the cause of death be a lack of affordable housing in the town where he works, a lack of safe sidewalks and bike paths for his children, and a torturously slow public transit system? So you see at this meeting, it is very important to those concerned with health. This document in front of us, the Draft Policy Preferences Report, gives our coalition hope that more of Santa Barbara citizens will have true choices in the affordable housing, close to work, transportation, access to healthy foods, and safe places for children to grow and play. The draft report includes a few health concerns in a number of locations, and our coalition would like to comment on a few specifics. The coalition recommends that public health be listed as a significant policy driver of the, the four existing, adding a fifth for public health. Its local, regional, and global significance must be considered in both the goals and policies of planning and should be part of every element of the general plan. 
In particular, the land use and circulation elements are critical to a healthy community. The coalition recommends including health standards and benchmarks as part of the system evaluation and feedback as noted on page 12. Health professionals can offer planners historical measurements of community health, such as chronic disease, mortality, and fitness rates for our local area. One example of this is the fitness gram, a test administered to 5th, 7th, and ninth grade students at our local schools. The test includes a part where all students are asked to walk slash run a 12-minute mile. In 2004, only about 25% of all students passed this basic test. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see this measurement change due to planned Santa Barbara improvements such as safe routes to schools? In the land use growth management element on page 15, the coalition recommends that sustainable neighborhood plans take into account health issues of that particular neighborhood. For example, access to healthy foods by measuring the number of produce vendors and placing reasonable limits on fast food restaurants. Housing dedicated for critical workforce employees would include health-related personnel and the related support personnel. And documents ident documented health benefits of green spaces, both physical and mental, can be identified and strengthen the position of park and open space planning. In the draft policy preferences report under community design historical resources, development guides are proposed to promote a healthy urban environment in which public health epidemics such as obesity, asthma, and diabetes are considered in all land use and circulation decisions. This is a laudable policy and given special prominence in this section. However, in order to support this policy and enhance the ongoing relationship between the city planning department and public health community, it will be necessary to have dedicated planning and public health staff time to develop guidelines, assess existing conditions in the required detail, and the potential impact of future development. This will require political will and funding on the part of both the health organizations and the City of Santa Barbara. We recommend it. In the circulation element, the coalition recommends that parking restrictions go hand in glove with significant improvements in transit. The city's own transportation demand management program is a lesson in the necessity of both pieces of this puzzle. As reported in the recently released Transportation Existing Conditions Report, all SB City employees have access to a free MTD transit pass. Sadly, less than 10% of our 1,727 city employees actually use their free MTD passes during the second half of 07. Possibly undermining this program is the provision of free parking to city staff at two downtown commuter lots. We caution the city, however, to significantly implement transit improvements prior to parking restrictions as current transit options are inadequate for most consumers. Our transit company, MTD, must begin to focus on serving the choice riders. These are the citizens that have the option to drive a car but would take the bus if it were truly convenient and conveniently scheduled and seamlessly connected. This type of transportation functions in numerous locations internationally to transport professionals and school children where they need to go. We need to learn from those communities with truly world-class transit systems and adopt the best of the best. Santa Barbara, we can do better. Finally, the, econ the economy fiscal health element reflects the importance of health as an integral part of the economic development. A healthy population is the wellspring of economic growth. Chronic disease costs, it costs in years, dollars, and the mental and physical health of the patient and the caregiving family. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention found that the direct medical expense associated with physical acti inactivity totaled more than $76 billion in 2000. We can use that money in better ways, don't you agree? In closing, our coalition heartily endorses the passage of Measure A to assist with the funding of alternative modes of transportation. This is perhaps the single most important local measure facing our voters in November, crucial to the implement of the vision expressed in the draft policy preferences report and supported by the coalition. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Gil Berry will be followed by Alex Pujol. Good afternoon. My name is Gil Berry. I'd like to share with you some ideas I had about the extension of Measure E and the non-residential component in the various scenarios of the Plan Santa Barbara. And even though the previous Measure E was 3 million square feet, that 3 million square feet included 1,600,000 of 
pending and approved projects at the time it was approved. And of the three million square feet, only approximately one and a half million was built, including the pending and approved portions. This means that if we have a new 1,500,000 non-residential continuation of Measure E for the next 20 years, it will be essentially business as usual. And the previous Measure E is what gave us the more jobs than housing imbalance. So to improve our jobs, to, I mean, to improve our jobs, housing, and balance requires reducing the number below 1,500,000, which I would suggest should be reduced to 1 million square feet, and on top of that, to remove the transfer of existing development rights. The second point I'd like to make, and the last point, is that the average jobs in the non-residential commercial areas or buildings, I should say, are approximately one job per 250 square feet. Therefore, 1,500,000 square feet of non-residential can create 6,000 new jobs. So even if we build 200 uh, units per year, which would be 4,000 new units over the 20 years, the 1.5 million square feet of non-residential could cause even worse job housing and balance than we have now and cause even more commuters than we have now. So I would ask you to please change one of the scenarios to be studied in the EIR to one million square feet of non-residential, which would include the current pending and approved projects. And on top of that, we should also remove the transfer of existing development rights. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Pujol be followed by Connie Hanna. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, and City uh, Council Members, Commissioners. I'm Alex Pujo, speaking on behalf of Santa Barbara for All. And to make it brief, I agree with the comments made by the gentleman representing the Community Wellness Coalition, Nikki Flax and Dave Davis. But before I proceed, I want to make sure that whoever brought those cookies <laughs> to the meeting, they give them proper credit, because that's a display of grace seldom found at these type of meetings. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, I speak on, on support of the Charter Amendment, and this is something that has urgency. There's urgency to this Charter Amendment. Why? Because there is another thing on the ballot on 2009, and, and the timeline is kicking. And as I have spoken to you at least six times about this, about my opposition to this initiative because it has no exceptions, and it has no other items associated with it, no other provisions. And at the time, the urgency was given us, uh, in the words of some people, perhaps present at this room, that we got to close the barns before the horses leave or after the horses leave. I'm not sure what it was. And there, was some inf there were some charts and, and presented that all this chart, all this thing going up, 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 and we're going to have this tsunami wave of development over 45 feet crashing on us. And, well, and I mentioned to you previously that the chart was really more or less like that, and now you see how it is like that, and we're not going to see anything for the next probably five to maybe seven years of, of these larger buildings that we are showing right there. But your legislation is the future. So when, when, when voters uh, cast their ballots in 2009, they're talking about the future, right? And that future will have climate change, energy usage with different costs, they will have different mandates from the state and, and, and the federal government. And, well, regarding sprawl and energy and so forth, and um, if you look at your surveys, and I got in trouble last time I mentioned this, but I, I, maybe I'll be unkind mm -hmm. to say that, you know, if you look at the results of the survey that was given to you, is that the, 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 uh, the age group that supports the, the, uh, the height limits, is all those 65 and over, it's not 40 to 65, it's not 18 to 24 and so forth. And we're talking about the future. So something stays on the ballot, it stays on, on the chart, and so forth. So I think there's, there's pressure to really provide a, 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 an option to the, to the, to the voters to, to have something that, that is meaningful, that, that, con, that constrains heights to something related to community priorities, or have been already mentioned, that have to do with like an expansion of an opera house like the Granada, for instance, or an expansion of a hospital like the, like the Cottage Hospital, or a, an industrial facility, the Marble, Marble facility. 
or the airport. Those are things that are real. Those are not inventions. Plus the double ex inclusionary house, uh, affordable housing, plus rentals. Those would be the exceptions. And there would be something there that should also address some minimal issues like setbacks and open space. And your ordinance committee is suggesting a five-foot setback uh, average. So it could be 10 feet somewhere, zero and others. And regarding the unit size, I was the one who spoke, uh, one of the persons who spoke against it at, at, the, at the previous hearings. It's not that we don't support that, but it is a very large discussion. It's part of variable density. It has to do with parking. It has to do with density. Is it what the city really needs? Is smaller units? Yes. But does it mean, like, you don't put more units or, or you just keep the same units smaller? Is the intent really to reduce the size of the building? I understand that. But the intent is also to provide more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Connie Hanna, followed by Kathy McCammon. Hi. I'm Connie Hanna, speaking for the League of Women Voters. Having attended the Planning Commission hearing on September 25th, the League is struck by a remarkable irony. Several years ago, when we began the general plan update, you subtitled it, Living Within Our Resources. That has been the motto of the city since the development of the charter, because we've always been aware of the limitations imposed by our unique location in between the mountains and the ocean. That is our special charm, and it also is a barrier to some development. We see that you are considering this very seriously because you've been discussing it for an hour already. As you heard at the meeting on the 25th, the staff presented quite reasonable figures for the development of the city for the next 20 years. They proposed that the project identified for the environmental impact report 1.5 million, 1 million square feet of commercial development and 2,000 new dwelling units. That would be very similar to what our traditional growth has been. The League would support those figures because they are almost certainly within our resource constraints. Combined with adaptive management, they could be monitored to see that they didn't exceed the water, sewer, or traffic resources. However, at that meeting, the city attorney pointed out that the city has already been assigned 4,338 dwelling units under the state's RENA program. He reported that the state would not approve the city's housing element with a proposed 2,000-unit goal, and we have seen in other jurisdictions that that is probably true. So will the state unfunded mandate determine our general plan update? What does that do for local control of planning? The state knows nothing about the problems with development that we experience here. For just one example, they keep requiring a high percentage of affordable units in all development, but without full government subsidy, no really affordable units can be built here. And like the state, the city has limited financial resources. Because we are a charter city, and with the city's excellent record of producing and maintaining low and moderate income housing, the League thinks that the city should look seriously at self-certifying your own housing element. You may well be able to qualify to do so. Consider carefully any penalties that are involved. Would they be more costly than the permanent use of desalination? Would they be more costly than impossible traffic jams that could never be improved? We know that the city has limited resources and money, and we should live within our means, even though the rest of the country doesn't. <laughs> the League wants to encourage you to keep trying to do so. Thank you.
Thank you. Kathy McCammon will be followed by Debbie Cox Bilton. Uh, and then the last speaker will be Lisa Plowman. Yes. Kathy? I'm Kathy McCammon, and I'm here speaking for League of Women Voters also. And I will have to say, for the first time, I do agree with Alex Pujol. The cookies are a very nice touch. <laughs> um, I'm here to address some of the things that were in Plan Santa Barbara in the policy preferences. The League is very concerned about the MODA, the Mobility-Oriented Development Area, which was a very recent concept introduced into the process. It appeared for the first time in dealing with the policy preference discussions. At first it applied only to State Street, but then it sort of morphed to also take in Cliff Drive on the Mesa and Cabrillo along the waterfront. We believe that this concept and its assumptions warrant further study. The basic premise is that those living within a quarter to a half mile on either side of the transportation corridor will opt for public transit and that higher density development is applicable here and the standards for grant units in these areas should be reduced. The assumptions we believe that need to be studied before we get into this are as follows. In a community such as Santa Barbara, why are we assuming that just because people live along a transit corridor, they will take public transit? The assumptions being made are that the destinations people have to go to also are probably within a quarter to a half mile from the transit corridor. And we're also assuming they may not have, a, people may not have a different, a number of different tasks at different locations in a given day. For better or worse, we are blessed with a number of attractions here, and they're all relatively easy, within easy driving distance. But these could become a nightmare with, to reach with our current public transit. Moda assumes that while we have decent transit along State Street, our transit system will provide good connectivity to access other areas, and that the city or MTD has the money to pay for this. MTD recently had to raise their fares to pay for existing services. So where will the money come for the additional service needed for the connectivity? And the service needs, as the wellness group mentioned, the transit needs to be in place before we reduce parking. Also, another assumption is there's, there's no recognition at all of topographical features that may prevent those within a quarter to a half mile from reaching public transit. As the crow flies, it may be that, but you may have hills and obstacles in between. Also, there is the assumption that people will give up the convenience and ease of their personal transport. It would be helpful to know at what point congestion has to reach and other deterrents before people will actually abandon their cars. Every time I go to LA, I wonder about this question. Another assumption we believe needs to be studied is just because you zone for higher density, this does not mean that private developers will provide any meaningful amount of truly affordable housing without a city subsidy. There is absolutely no evidence in the record that they will be able to, that they can or will be able to do this. We think that MODA should not be applied to the Mesa and the waterfront. As was pointed out in the Planning Commission discussions, all three of the intersections used to reach the Mesa, Las Visitas, Carrillo, and Castillo, already have levels of service below those that are acceptable. As to Cabrillo, the Coastal Commission has consistently opposed housing and waterfront areas, and the League has opposed putting more housing at the waterfront because it interferes with what we believe should be public and recreational uses in that area. Another thing the League is concerned about is the assumption that somehow we will be able to house our commuters and address the jobs housing balance. We believe we need to look at the region realistically. And this region is from North County to Ventura and Oxnard. We need to look at this as a whole and realize that what we really have here is a transportation problem. We need to address the assumption that our commuters all want to move here and we can provide the type of housing they want and need. We don't think so. 
We think that we should be looking at rail and planning now how we will provide more convenient transportation for the commuters once they get here. So um, that is my formal statement on Plan Santa Barbara. Um, I do want to add a few other comments, however. Um, early on, we met with the city staff about Plan Santa Barbara, and we were concerned that whether the city had was providing enough resources. We want more study of these assumptions. We've heard other groups saying we want this, we want more study on this. We think there's more work that needs to be done, so we think the council needs to seriously look at the question of whether or not they need to provide more resources for Plan Santa Barbara. Um, also on the interim ordinance issue, we think that Plan Santa Barbara will take so much more time that we really need to be seriously looking at an interim ordinance as long as it does not detract too much from Plan Santa Barbara. Because we think people want to discuss the different items that were um, listed above as part of an interim ordinance to serve the city between now and when the general plan actually is approved. And of course, since we support the current initiative, we're very wary of any alternate charter amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Debbie Cox Pilton, followed by Lisa Plowman, and then Olivia Uribe. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Chair Myers. Uh, commissioners. My name is Debbie Cox Bolton. I'm here representing the Coastal Housing Coalition uh, and the concerns of hundreds of local, if not thousands of local employees, nurses, firefighters, doctors, uh, engineers, and others who make up the backbone of our community but can't afford to live here. Uh, just a note on Plan Santa Barbara. We've been grateful to be part of that process and echo those who said uh, that we appreciate the staff's um, going an extra mile to make sure there's a lot of, of room for input and um, uh, we, too, like others, believe that living within our resources is a critical framework for this discussion. We would say that um, providing housing for a local workforce um, instead of exporting those needs to uh, other communities is uh, a critical part of living within our resources. Uh, but we're here today to talk about the height limits, um, and we believe strongly that height limits, as you know, is critical determining, to determining how much below market housing can be built uh, in the city of Santa Barbara. Building height determines how many floors can be built, and as well documented, uh, when projects lose a floor, it's usually the below market units that suffer because they're the, the cheapest to be built uh, because they have the ceiling and floors already. Given that voters are to be given a choice on November, in November 2009 about the height issue, we feel strongly that it is important that they have some context for understanding this question. A height limit uh, in and of itself may sound innocuous, but we know from polls, including the recent Plan Santa Barbara poll, uh, that providing affordable housing for all income levels uh, of people here in, in Santa Barbara uh, is a top priority. And we think that it's important that they understand the connection between those two issues. Whether or not there's an interim ordin ordinance passed, we feel strongly that an alternative choice should be placed um, on the ballot so that voters can make an informed decision. And we support an option that limits heights but includes um, exceptions for the public benefits, including affordable and workforce housing, as we've heard, um, which we think reflects repeatedly what you've heard from Santa Barbara residents in terms of their priorities. Another reason for putting an alternative uh, uh, option on the ballot in terms of a charter amendment uh, is also something that's been talked about a lot today, which is uh, it's been said that to talk only about height in terms of the legitimate community concerns there are about uh, size, bulk, and scale of, of buildings uh, is like using a hatchet when we really need to use a scalpel. So we feel strongly that having um, a little bit more of a nuanced conversation that would include height but also setbacks and landscaping uh, is important and probably would provide a more appealing and appropriate solution to those concerns. So with that, we again hope that you will um, seriously consider putting the Charter Amendment forward. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Plowman, and then last speaker will be Olivia Uribe. Madam Chair, members of the Council and Commission, thank you. Um, I'm here. I, I am a member of SB for All, but I'm really here for myself today. Um, you've heard of a number of members from SB for All. <clears throat> and I just want to make a few comments just in general about the process and what I would support the uh, Council and the Planning Commission recommending the department move forward with. 
uh, I wanted to start with basically fundamentally I don't necessarily support the reduction in building heights. I think that the concept of reducing heights in our downtown is really contrary to the principles of community planning and sustainability. But I do recognize that there's been a, a type of development that's occurred over the last few years that people have expressed concern about maybe the size, the bulk, the scale, things that design um, uh, related uh, techniques probably could have taken care of. But there's also a concern about whether or not those projects are providing enough benefit to our community. And I think those are some legitimate issues. And even though I have this struggle about height, I think those other issues are really important and probably matter a little bit more. So with that, um, we came around to the conclusion that maybe some kind of alternative measure ought to be placed on the ballot to give people a chance to choose between an initiative that essentially just addresses height versus an initiative that could be put on the ballot by the city that could address height, but also create some incentives for community benef community projects um, that benefit us, like increasing the level of affordable housing in projects or other community priorities, something like Cottage Hospital or something for the arts, for instance. Um, I also want to make the point that I really think this issue ought to be addressed in our general plan, but we, we're sort of beyond that point now, and that's unfortunate. But as a way to minimize taking those issues out of that context, I would recommend a very streamlined alternative measure on the ballot that really addresses height, addresses exemptions for these community benefits, and maybe some landscaping. But all other issues um, with respect to like unit size or whatnot really ought to be fully discussed in the general plan process because I think they're complex and they would weigh the initiative down significantly and could possibly prevent the city from actually getting it on the ballot and giving the public the opportunity to choose. Whether or not you need an interim ordinance, I don't know. I'm not sure you do. I really don't think there's a rush to the well at this point with the way the economy is going. And I think that will siphon off staff efforts from uh, Plan Santa Barbara. So um, with that, uh, I wish you luck in your decision-making you. process, and thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you. Olivia Uribe, the last speaker. Hi, Olivia. Hi, my name is Olivia Uribe. I'm Associate Director of SB CAN, Santa Barbara County Action Network. Uh, we work on issues of affordable housing, open space, and transportation. And I want to talk to you today about uh, exceeding expectations. Um, when I came today, I thought we were going to be discussing only the uh, interim ordinance, and uh, lo and behold, we are talking about also a uh, charter, charter amendment, and that's definitely uh, exceeding my expectation. Um, a speaker previously had spoken about um, the doubt of if you provide uh, transit, how do we know people will use it? If you provide zoning for higher density, how do you know people will use it? Let's go ahead and, ex you know, work and hope that uh, behavior will exceed our expectations and plan for what makes the most amount of sense, plan for what's better. Um, I only have board approval to, to um, support the interim height ordinance, uh, but I would encourage everybody here who is making the decisions uh, to look at what in the end is going to provide the most amount of benefit for uh, all the residents of Santa Barbara, to, to what's going to promote the most amount of community benefit and what's going to uh, promote uh, diversity in our city. And whatever that is, um, that might be a, char a comprehensive char charter amendment. Um, I'd say go for that. And uh, if not, definitely stick with the interim height ordinance. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we have no more speakers. Um, I think it's for us to discuss, huh? and see where we're going to go with this thing. Yes, Doss? Well, I just wanted to give you the, the, uh, a little bit of the look from the Ordinance Committee it, itself. Uh, I think there was interest at the Ordinance Committee to look at unit size issues, uh, but we felt like the, the, that uh, the level of complexity with setbacks, open space, and heights was about as much as we could realistically tackle um, in the time frame uh, uh, necessary to do environmental review. And uh, though, uh, though there was diversity of views on, um, on the ordinance committee, uh, I think there was uh, a sense that 
um, uh, we should move forward with this process. Um, there, there was um, uh, either unanimity or a majority vote on uh, a, a um, charter amendment, but I believe by, by linking the charter amendment and the interim ordinance, we had a unanimous recommendation. Um, the, um, I just want to make a sort of observation about setbacks, um, uh, which is the probably the simplest element. Um, the committee has uh, uh, really uh, looked at uh, the staff recommended five foot variable setback, which is essentially an average. So part of the building could have a 10 foot uh, setback, part of the building have a zero um, uh, setback, uh, but essentially there would be articulation and the provision for uh, more space. Uh, it would be less clear what changes to open space would take take place, but I think we're we're close to there because there are some work that we have been doing within the past year on that issue. Um, and then the but the most important thing I think today to hear from the planning commissioners and council members is their feeling about whether there should be a differential in height between some kind of community benefit projects and projects and the average project that comes down the pike. And I just want to say very clearly that to me, that's the most important thing we need to proceed on, um, uh, and and it's to me it's most important that we proceed on a charter amendment. Though I'm happy if if folks uh, feel that um, to keep the community together, we need to have an interim ordinance as well. I'm happy to work on that too. I do think we need to focus on the charter amendment element because of the necessity of environmental review, and I guess to me fundamentally the only way to to bring together Santa Barbara's conflicting um, and paradoxical values on growth and affordable housing is to address a height limit, but to provide an exemption for uh, projects that uh, exceed our expectations on affordable and workforce housing. And how the committee art articulated it was essentially we should be looking at community benefit projects, and I would like to define that more because I don't want that to be a sort of loophole big enough to drive a truck through. Um, <clears throat> double inclusionary projects and rental projects, and I would just add in that because I've been thinking about the rentals, rental projects with some guarantees against a two-step flip. Um, uh, and, and I think that would be somewhat uh, simple to do, which would just mean that the inclusionary extraction would would happen automatically at the two-step flip um, if uh, the rental project was given the exemption. Um, so uh, I uh, I tend to be very loyal to any agreement, uh, and I uh, made an agreement to stand by uh, a 40-foot height limit with with a uh, a 12-foot additional height. Um, I would be willing to go along with something different, uh, but I think that that's, that was a good starting point. Now, albeit that was a, a height limit with um, uh, measured to the top of the plate heights to incentivize a rooftop. A rooftop essentially would not count mm -hmm. in the height. So um, because I um, uh, am, am loyal to the, the compromise worked out and uh, especially loyal to Sheila Lodge, I'm going to continue to defend that as the base point that we should be having. Um, if if that needs to be changed a little bit to get everybody on board, I'm still going to go with it. Um, uh, and maybe the one other thing we should hear from staff is if the plate height men, plate height measurement is something that staff, uh, even if they don't like it, could implement. Um, because again, my and and Sheila's intention and our our intention of the compromise was to incentivize roofs as opposed to having a 40-foot height limit where all of a sudden all of the um, red tile roofs get replaced with flat, uh, unarticulated, ugly rooftops, uh, which I think is a significant danger of the current height initiative that's brought, being brought forward. Um, so those are the things I would put out there, and I really just feel like we need to move with due speed to uh, have an, a, a charter amendment. Okay. Yes, Mr. House. Um, 
the um, just again a little bit of a report from ordinance, but also just to summarize where I find myself at this point, and I'm very eager to hear obviously the the broader discussion um, from others. But um, there's enough um, interest that I've heard in the public for an alternative on the ballot. I think that that's uh, we really owe it to the community to offer some kind of an alternative that um, that gives a choice. And I've heard enough um, that that it should be simple. It shouldn't be something very complex. We have the plan Santa Barbara process to really get into the, the nuances. And there's an awful lot to discuss that we really must take on. I think unit sizes is very important, but I don't know that that fits into a, uh, I mean, it becomes a very, very complex ballot measure if there were to be an alternative. And I don't think that would serve the community. The alternative should be something similar to what we've heard so far um, from speakers today. Uh, um, basically, um, uh, either either way you say it, a reduction in height uh, with exempt with an exemption or uh, holding on to the existing height. Um, and I don't know that we can work this out in terms of the details of what the actual number might be. But the um, but with exemptions for community benefit, for affordable housing, uh, possibly for rentals. But just about as simple as that. I think we have um, also a couple of small additional pieces that enrich it that could be in there. The, uh, the, the variable setback that we discussed and possibly enhanced landscaping. Um, but I believe that this is in the context of us recently strengthening the ability and encouraging our um, discretionary review bodies, the, the ones who are really given the task to work on the design elements um, in, in their discretion. They have now very clear guide, guidance as to how they are to communicate with the Planning Commission and um, how that process works. Um, had that really been emphasized uh, just even a very few years ago, we probably wouldn't even be having this conversation today, um, at least not in the same kind of uh, pressure cooker environment that we are in. Um, so I think that we're in the context of having already begun to strengthen and refine and enhance and encourage our design review boards to do their job in a, in a very effective way, consistent with the, all the guidelines and all the things that we have on the, on the land. Um, I think that we should um, definitely move ahead with an alternative for a ballot measure that's very simple and secondly, um, really give back to Plan Santa Barbara these um, much more nuanced and, and complex issues that definitely need to be discussed in the in the context of community development. Okay. Thank you. Next, Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah. Um, I'll, uh, one comment that I'd like to make that uh, it would it'd be sort of subject to approval of of our council, and that is, uh, I have advocated, uh, been advocating the, the unit size as a as a good, simple tool for uh, solving a s several uh, problems. And I have advocated and, and advocate today for guidelines for smaller, uh, to come up with a set of guidelines that are uh, what's it, what's it, an appropriate or, or whatever word you'd use? Studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. We've had this discussion uh, at length at at planning commission. As a guideline, my question to council would be: it, Do we need environmental review for that? Could the city, could council and planning commission uh, work with? Um, Mr. Pikert's office, Mr. Cornell's office, sort of do a, a sort of a charrette on unit size. We do the field, uh, go around and look in the field at the different, this is what this feels like and so forth and so on. Come back and, and see if we can't come to an understanding about, all right, this, this is what is a good uh, studio size, et cetera. If those guidelines are on the books, uh, for the next however many years that the dialogue for Plan Santa Barbara goes through, uh, I'm thinking of it as inexpensive if it doesn't require environmental, re environmental review, et cetera. It would be a way for, of course, a developer comes through and says, I want to build uh, a project. I know what a unit size is, is, is feeling okay uh, in the city. So that's uh, my way or one suggestion I'd like to put out there so long as it doesn't require environmental review. I do think that the interim ordinance is an exercise in futility at this point. 
um, the the big issue, of course, is the charter amendment. So that that was why I, I mentioned it at ordinance committee. I've been mentioning it at, at PC, and I hope that that idea will get uh, looked at seriously because it automatically takes care of the size, bulk, and scale issue. Not doesn't take care of it. It reduces the size, bulk, and scale issue. Obviously, then as we come back through Plan Santa Barbara, then the question of density will return to the table of how then do we are we able to take the 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 leftover square footage and make a higher density that's the question that, that then would be uh, thrashed out uh, as we go forward so uh, let's see the Rena I wanted to channel a little bit of John Jostice here for a moment I uh, he made a comment <laughs> well, is you know absences <laughs> can be death sometimes. Anyway, uh, he made a comment on the, when the arena thing came down that I thought was was really uh, it, it got to the heart of the matter. He said this is a real blow to regionalism. Um, it we get into the us versus them uh, syndrome when. Uh, my goodness, as things start to to really flow here, I mean, when we look at the at obviously at the stock market and the credit markets, when does the jobs housing imbalance start to sort of shift where maybe that we're sending remittances to Santa Maria that are appreciated instead of it being oh you know we're sending all the commuters down there. Well, if they don't have enough construction jobs in Santa Maria and there still is some down here that's sort of a steady state deal, there may be a change of viewpoint that. This isn't that some of that jobs housing imbalance is not as bad as it once was thought of. Just as the jobs housing imbalance with Mexico has its own sense of gratitude for being able to send uh, funds home uh, to folks. So, uh, the, and the, these changing times will will speak to us uh, uh, in different ways. Just as we've heard about transit and uh, MODA, uh, we need to stay uh, flexible. Um, I've been on the Planning Commission during this boom. I just I showed up uh, with uh, uh, the, the project down at the uh, uh, bottom of the of Cabrillo, Cabrillo Boulevard and mm -hmm. State, and I watched and, and participated in the big experiment in mixed use uh, and voted for a number of the big projects along with Mr. House, and um, not always with Mr. House, but we did the work together and, and, and Mr. Bartlett. Um, and I, my feeling about it is that some of those, even some that I voted for, did, did change the character of Santa Barbara, or did head in that direction. And of course, there was a lot of fear, and I had fear, that the boom, if the boom continued for another five or ten years, and at that uh, scale and pace that we really would have uh, a, a change of character. Uh, obviously, we have a, some breathing room in the development world right now. It's just, it's going to be five years, as I think Alex had said, something that's going to be that kind of time frame before uh, this financial system comes back together. So we do have a little bit of breathing room to, to rethink and also uh, uh, come up with some other ideas. I have been one of the people who got on board uh, early and, and crafted the 40, well, so-called 4540 initiative. And I do stand behind that. Um, I think that there, this, there's going to be opportunities with, um, f from here during this next five years, that I hope the city gets to use to come up with some more affordable housing uh, ideas. Will there be a way to, to purchase some property to uh, to the, go into the? There's now the the for sale signs are starting to pop up like mushrooms, and would there be some ways to uh, to, to preempt um, some some land for uh, for those kinds of uses? Um, another point is that the our if we built out to the super max end of our environmental, of our Plan Santa Barbara uh, environmental review, 7,000 units, the, uh, the, which is uh, the, the, the speedometer that's, you know, going 180 on, on, the, on, your, on your, your speedometer, uh, never having gone that, that uh, fast, we'd still end up with 13,000 jobs, uh, commuter jobs. 
uh, and that's if we don't build any of the, of the commercial square footage, and that, that none of the rest of the square footage that we have in place doesn't become more efficient. What are we seeing in commercial space? What used to be a, you know, divided into big offices is now cubicles, and that's one of the things that's going on. We don't know how much more intensification can, can occur in our commercial sector, but it's significant. I just know there's more efficient, uh, uh, more intense use possible out there. So we're going to end up with a substantial commuter base no matter what and I say I hopefully we do not lose sight of making an excellent and also we all travel regionally as well we all want to get to LA love to get to San Diego it's uh, and so the notion of regional travel uh, inexpensive and efficient we need to keep uh, high on the list and if it's more regional cooperation with Ventura County, I just think of that as sort of the, the urban magnet there. Obviously, we have our own uh, other elements with Buellton, et cetera. But that one heading south is, is one that I hope that the, the city as a whole, plants Santa Barbara in general, uh, keeps its eye, keeps our eye on the ball of an excellent uh, commuter system uh, between here and the Ventura Oxnard area. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Colleen. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A few things. Um, I appreciate hearing from others earlier. On Monday, I drove my car, and I drove my car to a number of different places. I had to get to Goleta and back, and I had to go to a friend's house who lives in Montecito and back, so I needed my car on Monday. Yesterday, I was dropped off and picked up at City Hall because my husband needed our car. We have one car, and that's what we have. Today, I took the bus, and I plan to take the little crosstown shuttle from here and go home. And so I find myself very fortunate that I have the ability to have those choices to do so. And I, and I want to bring that up because I think we got to remind ourselves that when we're talking about transit, it's not that bus riders will always be bus riders and car drivers will always be car drivers. The whole point is is that we have multiple options. And, um, and, and, and also to put some statistics behind the use of the bus transit, saying who takes the bus. Last fiscal year, MTD had over 8 million rides, first time ever. This year already, they're expecting to reach the 9 million mark. And that's tremendous. Over 8% ridership increase since July already they're seeing. Um, whether that's because of the cost of gas or people have, knowing more about the bus transit, the uh, increased services. I mean, there's multiple reasons why that happens. But I think we need to keep that in mind. And, and really, our region is of 200,000, if you look at the whole south coast, uh, is... One that has a transit system, really, that covers more like a city of or an area of a million. And, and that is, if you look anywhere around the country, you'll see that. So I think we, are, we, do have, we do want more, but I think in terms of where we are with our MTD system, we're pretty darn good. And, and it needs enhancements, and we need to look at that, and we need to subsidize it. We need to pass Measure A to make that happen in terms of funding. That's an important thing uh, regionally. Um, and then the other piece, and I know was mentioned about commuters coming in, absolutely, about getting people here and there. If they don't want to get their car to come here, they need options, and that could be a regional bus system. It also could be commuter rail, and as you know, many of us here um, have been trying to crack that nut, which is um, quite an issue in and of itself. So I just want to put some of those numbers up front, too, when we're talking about transportation, because I think, I think they're important. Uh, I liked the idea earlier about public health being policy driven um, and and I think that's in here in, in bits and pieces and probably not to the extent the Coalition for Community Wellness wanted to see it but I think we're getting to the point of making that link between urban planning and community health because obviously there are they are interconnected so I appreciated that that sentiment. Uh, the unit size I'm also a proponent of uh, of trying to figure out some ways to put together a maximum unit size guideline. And I wonder if there's a way we can do it separate and apart from any charter amendment ordinance and do something like Commissioner White was saying in terms of let's take a little tour. We like going on field trips or whatever, you know, and find out what does a good size one bedroom 
condo look like? What does a 2,300 square foot one bedroom condo look like? And we'll probably go, wow, and hear echoes and things like that. Mm-hmm. Or what does a 1,800 square foot one bedroom or two bedroom condo look like? And not to create mandates, not to create a standard, but just a tool, just as a, a guideline that design review boards can use, the planning commission can use, the city council can use to shape things um, in the future for the when I'm hearing practically zero projects that are going to come here between now and the next few years. But, you know, it's still a tool. Uh, and and I think it's still an important one, and I, I'd like to know about the environmental review structure, if it's just a guideline. I don't see it as being as, as, as um, huge as – you don't have to do that right now, but at some point. Um, but I don't see that as being so big and complex. What is complex is how it relates to bonus density and density by right, and that is a planned Santa Barbara issue. No way, no how do I want to get in the middle of that separate from and apart from planned Santa Barbara. So i got to put i got to put another plug in for for the unit size guidelines because I think it can be done in a way that's not onerous um, and can actually create a benefit. Um, the then this whole charter amendment, um, zoning ordinance, all these all these other things. I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna try to complicate it. One other thing, which I think we might the timing might be right to do this. We have, as we know, a charter amendment that that's already on. That's a, that's happening. So it's there. So we have an opportunity, and it's about really the the, the feel of the city. Um, it, it's talking about height, but really a lot of the conversation about it is also going to be about design, and it's also going to be about what does it look like. And a few years ago, the city tried and miserably failed to put on the ballot um, a charter amendment to change how the council is allowed to appoint members to the Architectural Board of Review. Currently, uh, you have to be a resident of the city to serve on the ABR, and ABR also has very su- substantial requirements in terms of your expertise. You can't just be some resident of the city that likes Santa Barbara. You might have to be a landscape architect or a licensed architect, and there are only so many of them. Um, whereas it's kind of funny, HLC, the Historic Landmarks Commission, doesn't have that requirement. You can live outside the city and serve on HLC. So there, the timing might be right now to Put that back on the ballot. Very simple. Talk about ABR, and and hopefully, even if you're on one side or another of this height um, amendment, we might be able to rally the community to talk about it in a way that we didn't do a few years ago, and really um, amend the charter that might help us all. So I'd like to throw that out now in this body and and see if that can fit in the pipeline of things because I know there's a process to do that. On the issue here. Um, when it comes to an alternate uh, charter amendment or something, I, I go back to the LAFCO discussion. Th- this is what's going through my mind, in that if you remember with the sphere of influence and Nolita, or I heard I heard another term for it. It was called the demilitarized zone, which I <laughs> thought was hilarious. Um, but uh, but well, we'll call it Nolita for now. Um, Every, I think most of the people around here thought, well, there's a community, they came together, they gave us petitions, they were for it, they were excited, they wanted this area to be in the sphere of influence of the city of Santa Barbara. And, and unanimously, the council said, yes, let's move forward, let's go to LAFCO, the local area formation commission, and ask for that. When it got to LAFCO, which had people other than people, residents within the city, the the criticism was not the huge number of petitions and the enthusiasm about one or the other, but it was about we don't know if people actually got the full range of options that that they should have been presented to them, because the, because the way some people understood it was you can either be in the sphere of influence in, in the city of Goleta, you can be in the sphere of influence or the city of Santa Barbara, one or the other, and the and the criticism was that they felt like they didn't hear the option that they could stay where they are, which is in the unincorporated area. So until we figured that out, LAFCO didn't want to make any determination and expand that sphere of influence. We didn't like that decision because we wanted to go through with the process, but that was and – and I think about that when I think about the current situation now with 60-foot height limit and the, and the, and the one only, – and only having one option on the ballot as a, as a yes or no and not having something very, very, very simple in the middle to ask the voters, okay, really, what is it that you want? I mean, frankly, I don't care. What, tell me, voters, what do you want? And we'll, we'll do it. And, um, you know, let the debates begin. But let the debate begin in something that makes 
that that people can actually have a variety of votes. And I and I don't want to put it out to say that that this alternate ballot is for or against the one that's currently mentioned. Because I I gotta say, getting nine thousand signatures to put something on a ballot is a huge feat, and it's something to be commended and acknowledged. And I do. Um, I just want to make sure that when people go to the polls next year, that they are informed about what it is that they're voting for, and that they get all the information out there. And perhaps putting a very simple charter amendment as another option, and they could vote down both of them and keep the status quo. That's up to the voter. But that would be that's where I'm coming from in terms of if we want to put another charter amendment there. But again, yeah, keep it simple. And then finally, on the um, interim ordinance. I, I appreciate and understand the, the desire to try to put something forward. I, I'm fine with that only if it doesn't drag out Plan Santa Barbara further. And I don't know if we can do both. And so I would have to be convinced of that first. Um, and because I'm hearing, you know, let's do the ordinance, but don't make Plan Santa Barbara take too long. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of struggling with that, where if, if the charter amendment is we have to do it, in the sense if we want to have an extra choice because something else is already there. I mean, that, that's the situation that we're in. But, um, you know, otherwise we'd say let's just do Plan of Santa Barbara, but that's not, that's not the reality. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not sure where to go with this interim ordinance in terms of how detailed it gets, what it means, except for unit size, which is different, okay? I got to know. But, but mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, you know, so those are my thoughts. I'd love to hear from some of the planning commissioners because you're the ones that are really going through all this with a fine tooth comb and God bless you for doing it because uh, <laughs> that's a tough job and I really appreciate all the work you've done. Charmaine? Yeah. Okay, I'll chime in. Mm -hmm. um, for me, at least today, we're talking uh, really about staff resources and, and funding and um, where we're sending our planning staff to uh, invest their time and energy. Um, so I'm going to focus on that. Um, and I have three items. Uh, the first is that our housing element does have a, a, due, de a due date. Um, it has a deadline by which it has to be submitted. So really we are time driven on that housing element. And related to the housing element is the land use element. And we keep saying let's not slow down Santa Bar Plan Santa Barbara or that belongs in Plan Santa Barbara. The fact is Plan Santa Barbara is tr trucking along at a certain pace no matter what we do because it has to. Um, and for me, the, um, the appropriate place for discussion about unit size and density and building height and all of this really <laughs> is the Plan Santa Barbara discussion. And I think that the main effort, the staffing and the funding should be there. Um, and in, uh, in the best of all possible worlds, there would even be some time and staff left over for form-based coding in at least two of our commercial districts, that's the downtown core, and which includes the El Pueblo Viejo, as as I've shown, I'm, I took, I even brought maps to the ordinance committee um, to to show how that downtown core overlaps with the historic preservation area. Um, but that's a discussion for Plan Santa Barbara, and I would hope that the um, the main effort and staffing and funding goes there. <clears throat> Secondly, the next reality checkpoint is the November 9th or the November 2009 ballot initiative. That's going forward um, uh, as we speak. And the city needs, I think, to get an alternative ballot measure uh, put together. <clears throat> uh, personally, my vote will be tied to, to the preservation of the historic character of the city. Um, and that's why I support the current e Save El Pueblo Viejo initiative. Um, and so for, uh, for an alternative measure to uh, to make me happy, it would have to be tied to uh, very strict height limitations around the uh, historic core of our city. <clears throat> but that needs more, uh, more teasing out. And then thirdly, the interim ordinance. Um, this can be interim ordinance light. It's temporary. And by its temporary nature, I believe the EIR requirements uh, drop away. And we're looking instead at a uh, mitigated negative declaration. Um, so <clears throat> really, the, the city could create something fairly light. And what I'm hearing from people is it's the size of the box that's bothering them the most. And that a, uh, a, a size of the box interim ordinance that says how tall, how much open space has got to be around it does enough for the interim time. 
<clears throat> hopefully saving some staff uh, resources that can be better invested in the Plan Santa Barbara process. Uh, so those are my, my three items. Uh, focus on Plan Santa Barbara, make a ballot initiative, and really go light on the interim ordinance. Thank you, Bruce. Well, I, like many times, tend to come on. Tend to agree with Charmaine. We always seem to come to the same conclusions. A lot of times for different reasons, and that's why it's interesting. Because if we can get both of us agreeing on something, we know we've covered all the bases, and it's pro it's probably pretty good. So we are our own checks and balances, and uh, I, I just enjoy that collaboration that we have on Planning Commission. I think. Uh, I'm in line with almost all of the comments that you made. I, I think we really need to keep our focus on Plan Santa Barbara. We have timelines that we need to come up with. Many of these issues are complex and can't be just pulled out as, a, as an interim ordinance. Um, but I do agree that we need to have an alternate ballot initiative. I think right now we have you know, a real blunt instrument to choose from or no tool at all. And I think there's something in between that hopefully will help pull people together. And we, I think we all realize that we like the same attributes of our community. And I, I think that that would go a long way in helping to further plan Santa Barbara if we could come together with a ballot initiative that not only addresses heights, but gives us the open space and, as you put it, Charmaine, the, the size of the box. That's what we're all viewing. And for that reason, I don't want to model that aspect currently in an interim ordinance with unit size. If you can't perceive how big the units are inside the box, that really shouldn't be a public issue now, especially since there is no rush to the well. I mean, the horses are not leaving the barn. I don't, I'm not sure they're even alive in the barn. So, uh, you know, let's not uh, let's let's just go on Plan Santa Barbara and, and and get that right. I mean, there's already so many disincentives for developers to do anything right now that to add more limits if you if you can only build six or eight units under current unit size and you just restrict the unit size and don't do anything with density, then we just won't have any projects. So I know. You know, our goal is to provide some housing, but we don't want to just disincentivize everything uh, in the interim. And I don't think that, uh, you know, we're giving away the farm if we take a year or so and get Plan Santa Barbara right. But I do think that the alternate ballot initiative is what really should be there. I mean, we at least get to vote for more than one presidential candidate, so why not? It's not anti-democratic. And if the city has the ability to put an alternate on that has gone through an EIR process, that I think that speaks highly. It can deal with more issues. And I think that's what re we really should rally around and figure out what things do we all tend to agree on and try and get something that uh, is not necessarily a win-win for everybody, but it gives most people something that they can latch onto that's better than the two extreme choices that they currently have. Um, I am not totally married to the heights that were proposed in the sort of the interim that was brought out, I think it was in April, as the compromise. I think that is cumbersome only in that it really brings about a different measurement of building height in terms of measuring to, to eaves and disincentivizing roofs. And I hate to have you know downtown areas having different metrics for measurement than everywhere else in the city. So if the intent is, you know, 40-foot eave lines or parapets and the roofs can then be allowed to go to 45, I would be supportive, you know, of the 45-foot height direction, you know, with uh, the variance given for certain community benefits, if we could all agree on what those are. But I also like staff's recommendation to acknowledge the sensitivity to the EPV and provide that buffer zone where it abuts the designated historic structures so that we also have that safeguard in, not just talking about the use in the box, but what it's adjacent to. So I think that would be a valuable component in, in the height discussion. And I think uh, 
most of the other items, if we can just keep it uh, simple, you know, the average setback, I think uh, most everybody at Ordinance Committee was happy with that, with the exceptions being State Street, essentially from the freeway, and I think we talked about maybe even extending that up to Sola Street, since that's really the block where Arlington Theater and everything's already built to the sidewalk, that and the cross streets to Anacapa and Chapala, I think there's agreement there, so I think, you know, a lot of people could get behind that issue. And open space, I can't imagine anybody arguing with that. We all want more open space. So I think if we can latch on to those three things and really pick the best of all of those, we would have a winner if we can keep it simple enough to not get into EIR territory. So I don't really think that an interim ordinance is necessary, but I would like us to focus on a good ballot initiative alternative. And, and keep our eye on the Plan Santa Barbara ball. With it, you know, the future is changing so fast in front of us, we can't gauge everything on our historical growth rates or anything historical anymore. We just we need to have all options open. So let's not foreclose on the future and let's think about what is possible. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Addison. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first, the. Uh, yeah. The issues that the staff brought up, charter amendment, yes or no, the substance, and so forth. First, on the interim ordinance, my understanding at the press conference when that was first announced was that the whole intent was to uh, obviate the necessity for the charter amendment that was in the process of gathering signatures. Well, if that's the case, then the opportunity has really passed because we know that it's a done deal and it will be on the ballot so I wouldn't recommend spending a lot of time on uh, of the staff time working on the uh, interim ordinance at this point because if the original objective has already uh, gone past uh, why, why spend any more time than we need to not that the discussion won't be valuable to roll into the uh, general plan update and the subsequent enabling ordinance uh, but I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. As far as the idea of uh, charter amendment, I think Dave Davis expressed my position pretty well. I think that it's good to have a, an alternative that is simple but does provide an option for people to vote on a, 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 a proposed charter amendment that would provide a little more uh, flexibility and provide a little more of what I think the community is looking for other than a blunt instrument, just height limit. I understand why the height limit was made very simple, and as was discussed, to make it easy to get people to understand and to sign a petition, but I think we can craft one that's not overly complicated but does provide an alternative that, as we all talked about, uh, would provide for some community benefit. And the concept of a community benefit component to that, I think, is very important. Finally, the issue of unit sizes in the ordinance. I would urge caution that we don't try to get too much specific detail in the general plan. And I also would urge caution that we don't try to mandate unit sizes in the city ordinance. I think it would be a better way to try to incentivize to get what we want, smaller unit sizes, perhaps uh, tie the amount of density that a property owner could get to the unit sizes. More units, more density. Uh, if he wants to build the big luxury units, he gets less density. So I, I think it should be an incentive rather than just cut and paste, try to decide what the city thinks a two-bedroom unit should be and put it down in the ordinance. I, I, I think we would subject ourselves to legal challenge and it probably isn't the way to get where we want to go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. George? Yeah. You want to use it? I think I'm Are good. You up? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam mm -hmm. Mayor. Well, I don't know if I have too much uh, uh, that I disagree with with what I've already heard. I, I appreciate Mr. Bartlett and Mr. Thompson's uh, uh, approach to uh, especially keeping the uh, focus on Plan Santa Barbara and and looking at a an alternate uh, ballot measure uh, that the voters could have a comparison against. Uh, I think that a simple comprehensive charter uh, uh, amendment is certainly the way to go. Um, 
I have some concerns, and, 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 I, and, I, and I think, you know, as we go through this plan Santa Barbara thing, the, one of the main things that we're focusing on is adaptive, adaptive management and how do we get down the road and measure ourselves against our goals and objectives. And then, and then as time gives us different challenges, how do we adaptively um, correct ourselves? And if the, the biggest concern I have about putting height limits uh, in, in effect is that uh, we can't do that very well. Um, I, I think that if we, if we go with the 45 feet and we have community benefit priorities, that maybe that somewhat gets there a little bit. But um, I'm, I personally am in favor of keeping this 60-foot height limit. I think that our review boards do a fantastic job of, of, um, of being very discerning about how we use that. I think that uh, the effort that's going to be put in place about our historic districts and how we, how we buffer them will certainly uh, protect what we want to there. But I, I just have this, I have this concern that uh, as we go down the road and as some of the things that Dave Davis has been professing for some time now uh, come into effect, that it's, it's almost sort of a moral vacancy on our part to, to say that it's okay for police to live down in Ventura. It's okay for nurses to live down in Ventura. It's okay for um, you know, the, the, the people that we need here, not all of the commuters that we want to bring back from Ventura and, and Santa Maria, but the people we really need here at a time when things are going to get a little rough, uh, that we can't supply housing for them because we've taken away uh, some community character height limit. I think we can maintain our community, community character in a very profound and sufficient way and still maintain uh, the current height limit. So that's my two cents in, in that regard. Uh, I, 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 I disagree that we should go down the path of a, a, a um, a, a, uh, an ordinance amendment. I think that you know, focusing on Plan Santa Barbara is probably the way to go. I think unit sizes uh, are are probably the discussion for unit sizes are probably more appropriate there than trying to uh, muddy the waters with something else here. Although I certainly appreciate and really uh, appreciate even more your, um, Mr. White's uh, crusade in this in this effort because I think it really is uh, something that's going to. I think his approach has some incredible merit. Uh, uh, Helene has brought up our sphere of influence regarding the ABR. I think uh, I think those same standards apply to the Planning Commission. Would like to see uh, that that broadened a little bit as well. And um, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Gail. Do you have anything? Or are you gonna? I think you're the last one. Uh, oh, you too, Scott. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're too close to me. For two <laughs> uh, well, of course, uh, I was part of the ordinance committee deliberations, and um, I think an interim ordinance probably would be a waste of time <laughs> at this point. Uh, I'm not. Ex I'm personally not excited about trying to get another charter amendment on the ballot, but uh, what I expressed. In, in the ordinance committee hearing, what I still believe is that in order for something like that to be worthwhile, it has to be a genuine alternative and it has to satisfy the concerns of the 9,000 people who got the existing charter amendment on the ballot. Uh, I don't believe that the uh, proposal in April got there. I don't think that it was sufficiently different from what already existed. So. Um, my suggestion was if people want to pursue such a charter amendment that, again, as everyone else has said, it has to be very simple, but it also has to address the concerns of the people who put the existing charter amendment on the ballot because if it doesn't, it will fail. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no doubt about it. Because if you've got 9,000 people willing to sign a petition to get something on the ballot, there's a lot of support for it. Uh, so that's... I, I think I agree with what everyone else has said that the, the interim ordinance is a distraction at this point, and that's what I had to say about uh, the possible charter amendment. And I'm surprised and gratified to hear Councilmember Schneider's statement about uh, trying to do something about the ABR membership requirements. I think that's really something we need to fix. Yeah. I 
wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. Okay, Scott. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, and, th and thank you, Councilman uh, Francisco, uh, because that I felt very similar. Uh, I want to speak to uh, uh, unit size. Everybody's talked about everything at this point, but I do want to contribute this. Uh, I have been many places in large cities, one uh, San Francisco, Chicago, other places, where unit size means nothing. You can go in and buy four or five units and combine them. And that's what's commonly done in other places. When, they, when there is a size restriction, it's not a problem. If you open your wallet, you can buy whatever you want. So, so even though we are going to uh, look at this, and I do want to study it, it is, again, going back to the market. And if somebody wants that uh, big view on the penthouse, mm -hmm. they can buy the whole top floor. And uh, there's a brisk business in my industry of uh, creating interiors for these places with linking stairways and magical openings and all that other stuff and it can be done here just as just as a, we don't restrict and I inquired about this on Planning Commission at a meeting we don't restrict the ability of someone to purchase real estate within the building so there's nothing that says you can't do that so even you know I think it's great we're going to study and put some time into this because in general that's not one would not expect that. However, in our city, there are no surprises. Mm -hmm. There are people who would do that. So on one hand, I think it's great to study. On another, it's a complete understanding that the market will do what it can bear to do. So, and, you know, interior designers and architects are cheerful about that. <laughs> Is it, oh, another beautiful thing to do. So... So, uh, you know, this is something that's, that we should all just be aware of, though, and not be surprised if it happens. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's, that was the most important thing I wanted to point out. I agree with uh, Charmaine uh, that, that we do have due dates, and we have, certain, we have had certain uh, deadlines come up, and, you know, we're trying to meet them, and, and we really need to focus getting Plan Santa Barbara. Keep it going. Keep it going. It's been... As everyone knows, long meetings, uh, generous outpouring of public thought, and uh, and we have some very gifted thinkers in this community, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, we benefit so greatly from our uh, from even outreach we don't intend to do and we get. Mm -hmm. So uh, so just keep it happening, and and I think that we'll we'll drag it through. You know, we'll get there. Uh, so, uh, so those are my thoughts, and uh, it's complex issues, yes, but we do deal with those. Oh, ABR, I served on ABR, and at the time that I was serving, we were feeling the dearth of applicants, and particularly in landscape architecture, and it, it is a very serious issue, and we had floated the idea of the sphere of influence in terms of recruitment. And I certainly would support that, especially in our sphere of influence, as it, if we can still call it that, but within our region going out. I, I couldn't say, oh, let's get some really hotsy guys from LA up here. <laughs> but I get, a little, I get a little eye twitch, you know, or Orange <laughs> County, you know. But, but I'm just thinking of what we have uh, available just outside our city limits, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that would be great to consider. So I was astounded when that didn't happen last time. I thought, whoa, well, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Then we need to really recruit amongst our own community, which is mm -hmm. hard because people have to step down on projects and all that jazz. Um, I do think we still need to consider, uh, I, and, and I don't think we should be lax in our pursuit of discussion and study and uh, resolu towards resolution about building heights. Uh, it's great to say, oh, we, we won't have to do anything for five to seven years. But you know, time flies. Mm -hmm. And then there we are again. And we have not made that any progress that, you know, we, we could get caught in a, in a, uh, in a loophole somehow there that, that would be no one's intention. 
but we would be very sorry for the vacuum. So those are my comments, and, and uh, I appreciate this session and a, a chance to sit down. I always appreciate these sessions. It's really great when we can uh, sort of get it all out there and, and look at it. And this one in particular I'm impressed with. Uh, I think it's because uh, we all, even though we have some differing thoughts, we all share a common goal, and that's to have uh, Plan Santa Barbara go forward and be accomplished. Staff's got it. We've got it. City Council's got it. Everybody sitting out there has got it. Everyone at home, I'm sure, is just dying to get it done. So, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I look forward to the next time. Okay. Thanks. Well, and I just wanted to add, uh, one thing that we didn't really talk a lot about is that public health thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's really wonderful that we've got a group now that are coming mm -hmm. forward, and I just think it's very wonderful that that kind of popped to the top uh, of our first round of, uh, of workshops. But uh, it's just, it's kind of an underlying thing we don't really talk about. In the past, we talked about living within our resources, and we knew it was healthy to do certain things, but we didn't think of it in terms of land use. And so now I really like the connection there. So as a significant driver of our policy, I think it's really important to have that in there. And then the other thing is the, uh, you know, the uh, unit size. I thought if we could just build, uh, you know, have smaller units, they wouldn't go for so much. But that just doesn't really work that much well in Santa Barbara. So I don't know. Uh, what's the difference between three 800 square foot dwelling units uh, in the same building versus one 2,400 square foot dwelling unit? Uh, both are one one bedroom. You know, I don't know. I don't know whether it's uh, you know, and is it income driven? Uh, as to what what the um, impact is on the city, and if so, can we, anyway, you know, I think there's a lot to be thought through on this thing, and I, I just think it's way too complicated to throw it into the mix for a ballot measure uh, next year. I just, you know, I, and we do have that one ballot measure. I agree with Dale that uh, it has to, I think we need to put an alternate on there, just like the two presidential candidates. That's a good, <laughs> I like that. Um, but it should be real simple. You know, it can just talk about height. We can talk about community priority above that height. Um, but otherwise, you're not going to get people supporting it, you know. Um, and if, if they say no to both, then we're still stuck with our 60 foot, which isn't horrible. So, um, you know, I just think it's a good idea to put on the other one. And I don't, I don't see the need for an interim ordinance, but I don't think, I really don't think, I think our city is going to ride out this little this recession which is really amazing uh, nobody has to worry about anything except those are who are ready to retire guess what <laughs> and so I'm in a little panic but otherwise uh, <laughs> yeah it's horrible uh, but I, I do think we kind of ride it out a little. We don't have as many foreclosures as other cities, and we don't have I, – I think we're going to have people who still want to put money into into development here if they have any. So um, – but, you know, so I think we're okay. But, yeah, I think I think putting that alternate on the, on the ballot is important. Mr. Casey. Madam Mayor. And helps. thank you, everybody. I think it was really a good discussion. I just wanted to throw that in there. It was very good dialogue. Yeah. I, maybe what I'll try to do is paraphrase what I think we heard and what I would say the next step would be. This okay. is a, a work session, so we're not taking any action out of this meeting today. What we would like to do is schedule an item on the City Council's agenda and looking at the tentative schedule, maybe November 11th, maybe November 18th. Okay. Um, we'll look at who's available in, in that regard and get it scheduled. But at that point, we'll look for direction. We'll bring forward, though, I think a recommendation because I think there's been general consensus that there is interest to look Look at an alternative charter amendment, not an interim zoning ordinance. And I, I think there was some general agreement about the direction of what that charter amendment would take as well. And so we'll kind of bring back what we heard just to kind of keep the dialogue going forward because we do got to move pretty quick if we're going to put a charter amendment on the ballot. And so we'll bring that back in early November and get formal direction from council. Our recommendation will be is let the ordinance committee develop that charter amendment and do the outreach and have it returned to the council just to keep it moving expeditiously in that way as well and keep our focus then on Plan Santa Barbara and going forward with the implementation steps we need to do to kind of keep that process going forward. So I agree, we've got a lot of good momentum going on, and we'll do that as well. So that's what we're taking out of today. Unit sizes sounds like maybe a little too complicated to deal on an interim basis. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms. Schneider. <laughs>
but you know, I, I think that's definitely still yeah. in the plan Santa Barbara discussion. We had some yeah. good dialogue about that today, and we're to look at that as well. Yeah. So that's what we would take from today, and we'll okay. be back to council in November. Okay, super. Thanks a lot. This was a good meeting. Thank you.